Good afternoon, everyone. This is our Wednesday, August 9th, regular Board of County Commissioners meeting. And today we've got a great uh, crew here from our Aspen Airport. Uh, they have been awarded uh, two years in a row, which is quite, quite an honor, uh, the Balchin Post Award for Outstanding Achievement in Airport Snow and Ice Control. And knowing that we are a ski resort and we compete amongst uh, many other ski re resorts as well as other areas of the country that deal with snow, that's quite an honor. So it's, it's great to recognize um, all of our crew that's here today and uh, we'll have an introduction and, and uh, some background on this, but congratulations on this uh, for your service and for keeping our runways uh, clean and, and uh, making our everyone safe to come in and out, out of our resort. Uh, Aspen Airport also achieved three years in a row from the FAA, zero discrepancies uh, in our safety inspection. So again, we continue to uh, raise that bar high, uh, provide great service uh, to our community, uh, and allow for safe uh, egress in and out of Aspen and Pickin County. So thank you. So with that, I want to welcome John Kennedy and his crew. John is our uh, director for the uh, Aspen Pickin County Airport. So welcome. Thank you, Chair, members of the Board of County Commissioners. Uh, thanks for the uh, the introduction. It really is uh, an impressive feat what uh, these men and women have delivered on behalf of Pitkin County and to all the users of Pitkin County Airport. The Balkan Award is not handed out every year. It's handed out by their peers of other snow belt airports. Uh, so <clears throat> unless you really exceed a trigger point or threshold, you're not going to be recognized. And they did it not only for the first time last year, two years ago, but now uh, for the second time, as you said, George, just last year as well. So couldn't be prouder of the, of the group. And uh, you know, if, if uh, some of the folks aren't familiar with what the level of dedication it takes from these people behind us, uh, it truly is Herculean. And I say that, and I'll leave it up to you whether you think that's too strong of a word after I explain what I think the definition of that is. But I've seen these uh, men and women work uh, six days straight, 10 days, 15, 20, as high as 23 days straight in conditions where they come in at 4.30 in the morning or even at 2.30 in the morning, work 14, 16, sometimes 18-hour days. We've had to ratchet them back for the concern of safety and proficiency, and they'll do that number of hours over that frequency of two weeks, pushing three weeks, because they had to to keep the airport uh, compliant and get the flights into uh, this resort town. Uh, so they'll come in at, at 4.30 and maybe leave at 6 or 7.30 at night, have an hour, hour and a half drive to get to their house, get some food, hit, hit the hay, and they may get four hours of sleep and they do it all over again because they get a call at 12 o'clock saying be here at 2.30. And they do this throughout every week throughout the seven to eight months uh, at times of when snow falls here in Aspen. So. A powder day to a lot of people here in town is a pretty exciting day. <laughs> They're going, okay, here we go, buckle up. <laughs> so it, it truly is a dedication of 24-7 during those seven months, and I just really couldn't be proud of these folks because I've only been associated with one other airport who received the Balkan Award. It really is a, a big deal, but to get it back-to-back -back years, I'm, I'm really proud of the men and women here who are not only full-time, but we also have some of our seasonal folks who also are equally dedicated and help us out to really deliver this level of service. So Phil Mraz, the Director of Operations, uh, sitting next to me, who really is at the tip of the spear of this program and works those crazy hours. Uh, <laughs> maybe you can introduce quickly the, the group of folks who are sitting behind you in terms of, and if you could stand up real quick after Phil uh, calls you, that would be great. So very proud of, the, proud of our employees. Yeah, so first of all, I'd like to start with our facility staff and our uh, facilities manager, uh, Scott Banesh. And then we have our two facility supervisors, uh, Vinny and uh, Vinny Oliver and Bill Russell. And then to continue with our facility staff, we still have uh, Jimmy Rickard, Anna Riza. <laughs> um, and then our seasonal staff, we have uh, Shonda Wolf, um, Bill Mormon, Brock, <laughs> and Ken Woods, Franz. Then our operations staff, that were a few hats there, and we have uh, Mr. Femi, uh, one of our supervisors here, um, Colin, and Derek, and Thomas. 
those are the ones that could make it here. And there's some that weren't able to make it. We have uh, David Snyder as well, and uh, James uh, Murawski and Travis Davis. They're the ones covering the airport right now. Somebody's at the and uh, door Adam open. Gardner. So that's our crew that we have Thank so you all for here. coming. It's great. It's great to have you here. So, so when it's not snowing, uh, what does everybody do? Sleep. <laughs> well, we have to always pre-plan and prepare for it. So that's what we're starting right now is um, making sure our a snow and ice control plan is up to par and trying to exceed it and make it better and all our practices as well not only air side but land side we gotta make sure all our passengers are traveling safely walking from their cars to the terminal to fly out so i always when i see john and, and on, a, on a snow day uh, i always ask john is the airport closed and he said no the airport's never closed no. <laughs> it's always open the planes may not be flying in but the airport is always open and, and thanks to uh, all of you guys and gals, that, that makes it possible. We really do thank you. We're very proud of what you do out there. Thank you. So we have a couple of uh, little plaques here. Um, John and Mark and I. Sure. Uh, this sure, is the 40th out. anniversary and the 41st anniversary. Again, this was last year, 2015-16. Uh, outstanding achievement in the airport snow and ice control for a small commercial airport. Awarded to the snow crew of the Aspen Picking County Airport, Aspen, Colorado. It's, uh, it's presented by the International Aviation Snow Symposium, which is sponsored by the Northeast chapter of the American Association of Airport Executives. So this comes from your peers. Your peers in the industry recognize you for the great work that you've done. And of course, this is this past winter, and we expect to see another one next year. <laughs> Congratulations. recognized three years in a row uh, zero di discrepancies uh, in terms of FAA safety inspection. So again, great job. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome to stick around if you like. Yeah. <laughs> it's not going to snow. Okay, let's see. Um, John, any additions or deletions to today's agenda? There are no additions or deletions to the agenda. Thanks, guys. <laughs> I still want to drive that big truck. Mm -mm. They said my feet won't touch the pants. So we're going to move on to our public comments. Anybody wishing to make a public comment, uh, you can come up to the mic here, please. Introduce yourself, and please limit your comments to about three minutes. Sir. Good day. My name is Bill Dinsmore. I'm coming on behalf of the Woody Creek Caucus, Woody Creek Planning Commission. I want to share with you two conclusions we've come to and ideas we've come to recently. Um, as you know, um, Woody Creek residents in the caucus was very clear and eventually, after a two-year process, on our position on the marijuana moratorium, growing and selling, retailing of marijuana. <clears throat> we talked in the Planning Commission at quite some length over a period of a month or two about whether it would be appropriate for us to have another vote in Woody Creek on that issue. And after we talked about it for a long time, we realized that we really had had a vote. It was called our planning document. The one we submitted to the county and you all accepted um, clearly expresses our position on the, maritor that, the marijuana issue. So we decided not to have an additional vote um, because we'd already ex expressed um, our position. And, and, and that um, planning document was overwhelmingly approved by the caucus members. So uh, that's just an update. We will not, the caucus will not be having a vote specifically on that issue. And, and clearly the, the, the vote, if it were to, were to have happened, was, was just to reiterate our position to you all prior to you considering it, I think in January or February of the coming year when, when the moratorium is up. And the second issue is about the airport. We in Woody Creek are, are, are as you know, um, most impact, one of the most impacted constituencies in the, co in the county about airport, airport traffic. Um, we have ongoing concerns about 
the, the operation of the airport and the proposed expansion specifically around a couple of points. One is the pollution that comes from particularly as the planes um, land and decelerate, the fuel that comes out the back is just as a function of how jet engines operate is very noxious and, and uh, more than noxious, it's, it's very dangerous and it's spewed all over our part of the neighborhood. Um, we're concerned about that. We're concerned about on continuing noise and if we were to go to larger planes and additional, and although we spoken with John Peacock, he graciously came to one of our meetings and gave us a, um, a, a good update on what may be coming in the future. But nonetheless, um, the chance of even larger and, and noisier planes is a concern to us. And the third concern that we have, which, and again, John, we talked about it at some length, our concerns about if we're to be an there to where, where there was to be an accident in these larger planes that we really are completely unprepared to deal with it, um, with the hospital, with emergency vehicles and staff, on, going, on and on and on. Um, and I don't know that we can resolve that, but it's a concern we have since that's where we live and, and the likelihood of an accident happening in proximity of where we are is probably um, higher than it is in a lot of other neighborhoods. Um, but we, that's a concern we have and, and, and we understand that it appears as though we as a small community are, are unable to, to address um, uh, a problem like that in any significant way above what we're doing right now. So those are my comments. Great, thank you, Bill. Great, Great thanks, Bill. You. We miss seeing you at yeah. on Main Street. John? We, oh, thank you. Thank miss you. you. Do you want to? Yeah, uh, just, and before Bill leaves, um, there are going to be two public hearings on the environmental assessment process where we'll be seeking public input. So we'll be sure to get that it, information uh, out to you guys so you can continue to participate in that Thanks, process. Great. Thanks, Thanks Bill. Bill. Anybody else wishing to make a public comment today? Seeing none, I'll close the public comment and bring it back for commissioner comments. Patty? I just, uh, it's been great to have this rain. I just got back from California where we had humidity in the mid 90s at the beach, which is unusual for California. So it was great to come home to dry rain, as you want to call it. Um, so I just get out and enjoy it. We hopefully will have some dry weather here coming up and so we can enjoy the rest of the summer and have a nice fall. Thank you. Steve? Uh, thank you. Uh, as we all hear many times, but maybe some people have not heard about the closure of the Grand Avenue Bridge <laughs> this Sunday night at midnight, and our traffic patterns are going to be different for a, at least a three-month period. Hopefully, they'll finish it on, on time within a three-month period. But um, if you live up at the, this end of the valley and need to go in the Denver direction, I would highly recommend people go over Independence Pass to get there and not, not try to go through Glenwood. And unless you're going through in the middle of the night or sometime when the traffic will be thinned out down there. So just to be aware that travel patterns will be different for a few months and there will be some long delays if you are trying to go through Glenwood at the wrong time of day. Thank you. Um, Rachel? Yeah, thank you. And uh, it's odd that you mentioned that, Steve. I was about to bring out the RAPTA Grand Avenue Bridge Detour Public Transit Routes. So there are these flyers around town. I picked one up at City Market. And planning ahead is very important. Uh, personally, I think we're going to see a lot of traffic on Independence Pass. And I think that uh, that's going to be a challenge for everyone. So uh, if you're a bicycler, you may want to rethink that route for your daily rides for a while. Uh, there's going to be uh, just traffic coming and going who are trying to get to the town, I'd say, in, in much increased numbers. And we all know how narrow and dangerous the pass is. So I agree with Steve. It's the way to go. But uh, it's going to be uh, more challenging than ever. And have patience. If you're behind that slow RV, you are behind that slow RV. There's pretty much no passing in most of the pass. Um, and uh, that's, that's my comments for today. Thank you. And speaking of more of a positive traffic patterns, I had the opportunity to uh, walk through the Basalt Underpass oh, last okay. night as I got off the uh, BRT bus. So the Basalt Underpass is open. They're still doing some work, lane work, and landscaping will go on for the next several weeks. Uh, but it's operable, and it's a pleasant experience. Yeah, I want to add another to, great project. I want to add to that because the goal was to have it open before the bridge closed. 
So I think it's commendable to everybody who was involved. It was an engineering feat. Um, we were surprised not to strike water at mm -hmm. all kinds of depths. So um, it, it's really remarkable the job they did there. I haven't had the opportunity. I came through the other night though, and it was like four late. It was like tr you know we weren't having to zigzag. So um, it was really it was really exciting, and I'm really proud of everybody who was part of it. Yeah, it's a great project. Okay, so with that, we'll move on to our regular uh, consent uh, items. These are single readings. The first is the minutes of the regular meetings of July 26 and a special meeting of August 1st. And the second is the ratification of the hearing officer's determination on appeals of assessor's valuation. Uh, I'll make a motion to approve both, but I do have a comment. I'll second the motion. Okay, Patty. I just want to thank Jeanette. Um, and um, her assistant, Miss Julia Ely, for all the hard work that went into this. Um, I read each and every one of them, so you know, and made some um, some notes on some of them, and I did address some questions I had already just to clarify. But this was massive amount of work, and um, I really appreciate all the time and effort you both put in, and everybody else, all the hearing officers, the assessor's office, this is not an easy process. It's a long process, and you guys did a great job, and I really want to thank you for all your work. Good. Uh, Steve? Um, when I read through the hearing officer's determinations, I learn something new on virtually every page because it, it's a very specialized field, and it, it's actually very interesting and about a mundane subject that really affects affects the people who make the appeals. So I, too, appreciate the work of our hearing officers. Rachel. Um, I am just wondering, I'm not sure, perhaps, Jeanette, you're the appropriate. Don't forget your mic over here. See what we're sharing. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I was wondering if Jeanette uh, or um, anyone else would like to give the process. These are folks who have gone into arbitration about a dispute on their property value, and it has been settled, essentially. Uh, changes were made going forward. But if someone did not agree with the hearing officer and the arbitration process, um, what are the next steps? I, I'm familiar, but I'd just like to let the public know and, and any potential deadlines they may have. Thank you, Larry. Yeah, um, Larry Fight with the County Assessor's Office. Uh, once the County Board of Equalization hearings have been concluded, uh, if people are still not satisfied with the outcome of that appeal, uh, they have three avenues to appeal beyond this level. Uh, two local choices would be binding arbitration uh, and district court. Uh, very seldom do people ex uh, choose district court just because of the time and the expense involved. Uh, and the third would be the State Board of Assessment Appeals, uh, which is a similar uh, board uh, to the CBOE, but it's comprised of uh, hearing officers that are assigned by uh, the Division of Property uh, Taxation. Uh, I believe there's a 30-day period uh, from the date that they uh, receive their notice uh, in order to file to one of those three levels of appeal. Um, and then uh, if somebody chooses uh, arbitration, for example, I think uh, they would contact uh, Jeanette, uh, the County Board of Equalization, who would provide them uh, with a list of arbitrators to choose from, uh, and then a date would be scheduled for an actual hearing. Uh, okay. With an appeal to the State Board of Assessment Appeals, uh, that information as far as how and where to apply uh, is provided with the notice uh, that will be mailed uh, you know, from the County Board of Equalization. Thank you. And one further question. This is a pretty significant packet of, of work, as Patty has alluded to, that uh, the hearing officers has done and your office. Um, are there more coming? Uh, at this point, uh, the County Board of Equalization, that's uh, a finished stack, uh, you know, for the County Board of Equalization. Uh, the deadline to file to that level was uh, the middle of July, July 15th. And so uh, if somebody did not file to the County Board at as of that date, then they uh, are, are going to be required to wait until the next calendar year, uh, in which case they can start the appeal process uh, all over again from scratch. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Larry. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 <laughs> Great. Thank you. Okay, next we're going on to our uh, individual consideration items. These are first readings. They are set for public hearing <coughs> on September 13th. 
And the first is a resolution authorizing the Community Office for Resource Efficiency, CORE, to expend funds generated through the Renewable Energy Mitigation Program, RIMP. Hello. Hello. Hi. Good afternoon. <laughs> Thank you for having us. My name is Mona Newton, and I'm the director of the Community Office for Resource Efficiency, and this is Marty Treadway. He's our grants manager, and we're here today for the first reading of our request for the Renewable Energy Mitigation Program. The Renewable Energy Mitigation Program was adopted in 2000 by the City of Aspen and Pitkin County as part of the building code. And this program allows homeowners who build larger homes or homes with additional energy features like snow melts, pools, and hot tubs to either offset that excess energy use by mitigating on site or they pay a fee in lieu, which goes into the Renewable Energy Mitigation Program. And with that, CORE is charged with offsetting that energy consumption through our programs. So we're here today to request funding to utilize some of the money that has been collected for several programs that will offset that energy consumption. And we are charged to offset that two times um, of the original amount that was paid into and we've done some research and over the years it can be anywhere from four to five times that amount so we're here today um, we'll start off with our we have several items that we're requesting funding for and um, I'll let Marty talk about the renewable energy the grant program that we have yeah, <clears throat> thank you, Mona. Um, this is Marty Treadway. Uh, as Mona mentioned, I'm the grants manager for CORE. And um, the, I guess, flagship grant, or the, the first grant to discuss today is the, the Randy Udall Energy Pioneer Grant. Um, historically, the, this was referred to as the Green Key Grant for, for many years. Um, and this is uh, CORE's larger projects, uh, larger efforts in the community to really uh, reduce uh, carbon where we can. Uh, the, the UDAL grant is available to provide funding to energy efficiency projects for public agencies, schools, nonprofits, and businesses in the Valley um, with the goal of uh, increasing energy efficiency, reducing uh, water consumption, and, and advocating for an installing renewable energy. So. Um, with those goals in mind, um, we have a, a process in place for uh, selecting these projects. They're, they're reviewed on an annual basis with a May 1st deadline every year. Now, the first step in that process is a citizens grant review committee um, made up of architects, realtors, uh, financial people, uh, sustainable-minded community members are, are on this committee. and. Um, they judge all of these applications based on a, a six criteria that we that we communicate: energy savings, community benefit, um, cost effectiveness, public visibility or education, um, innovative use of technology, and uh, urgent or unique opportunities. So, uh, those uh, six criteria populate a spreadsheet, and they score them, and they bring the, those recommendations, those rankings. Uh, to the core board uh, for review and comment. And so our, our board has reviewed that uh, this year's batch uh, back in June, I believe, and, um, and has now making a, a recommendation that you have in front of you in, in your packet for this year's batch. Uh, this year's batch, I believe, totals $555,000. It's a uh, uh, usually around a half a million that uh, the rent fund supports each year, so this is a, a slightly above that amount. Uh, there was about 1.5 million in requests this year, um, which is also fairly typical. Uh, so I would say, um, you know, I'm happy to go through these one at a time if, if you'd like me to. Um, but there are some sort of high-level takeaways. We could just read the bullets, and then if you'd like any further information, um, I'm happy to go into them. Um, the, the big story this year uh, about the UDAL grant 
applicants was was solar, was large scale solar, and it's something the core board has been prioritizing the last few years. How can we start producing some of our own energy here locally? And so toward that goal, um, we've been working with several entities up and down the valley on how can we maybe use um, some private property or even some publicly held property to install some larger solar production facilities in addition to just rooftop solar, which CORE will get to later. The CORE obviously continues to support. Um, so I think six of these 10 are large PV systems. You have them here on the, on the second page of your um, memo. Uh, the 2017-2018 the Randy Udall Energy Pioneer Grant Applicants. Um, apologize, they're not, I wanted them listed alphabetically, they're kind of scrambled, but uh, the, the city of Aspen this year uh, applied for two grants to support the, the new police department building. Um, one is for the police department proper building and the, the other was for the adjacent housing project um, off the back of the building. So technically two grant requests. Um, you'll see in the in the table here in front of you that um, 200,000 was requested for the APD and 199,000 for housing. Uh, the recommendation from the, the grant review committee and the core board um, ended up dedicating 135,000 for the APD building proper and uh, no separate uh, grant approved for the housing portion. So, um, you know, if, if that's divvied up amongst the city, I guess staff can figure out how to do that. But, but 135,000 was to support um, the APD project. The next item on your list is Red Mountain Inn in Glenwood Springs. And it's a small lodge that is trying to do some fun stuff with a water resource that they have on their property. So, um, that was a small enough request that everyone on the core board agreed and the citizens committee agreed that we could just provide a small community grant for that and it would not be approved for a UDAL grant. Um, next on the list, Aspen Waldorf Foundation uh, was approved, was recommended for $20,000 uh, replacing boilers. Um, Crimpy, uh, which is the Colorado Rocky Mountain Permaculture Institute, uh, is doing some innovative things uh, there always, and uh, they've requested uh, 109,000 for um, their off-the-grid cabin, providing some additional housing up there for their their staff, and some innovative gravity-fed irrigation systems. So that was recommended at 50,000. Uh, next is Picking County Landfill. Uh, if you recall, last year. Um, you approved a, a grant for some solar in Picking County. Um, this is what I would call phase two of that. Um, one project of Public Works is already completed, and so this, this project would be for the landfill. Uh, coming back for a request on that at, uh, was recommended at 75000 for funding. Uh, the Roaring Fork Conservancy, for years we've been working with them to get their new building underway. Uh, with some efficiency upgrades, some envelope upgrades, and um, obviously renewables. Uh, so that was, now that that project is finally moving forward, that's been recommended for 50000 as well. Uh, Roaring Fork School District, is, as you know, is building a new school at Riverview um, in between Carbondale and Glenwood Springs. Another large-scale solar project there at 336 kilowatts, which is, um, which is, significant and um, we've uh, recommended $100,000 uh, in funding for that. Um, and I was just recently made aware that they have also received uh, approval from XL Energy to be in their solar rewards program, so that's great news. There was concern on the core board that uh, if they didn't get that, would the project move forward? So looks like that's moving ahead. Uh, St. Benedict's Monastery is another one where they have a, a large site up there in Old Snowmass, perfect for large-scale PV that no one will ever see. <laughs> and so it's a pretty unique opportunity to get a large-scale system in place up there. See it. Sorry? I'll be able to see it from my house. Oh, actually. You will. <laughs> it's from it's about nobody. three miles so away. So it's not no one. Uh, yes, <laughs> apologize. <laughs> yes, um, but it is, uh, as you know, it is a challenge to get these some of these systems approved, and uh, that is a fairly unique 
um, <laughs> location back there. So sorry you'll be impacted, but if that moves mind. forward. <laughs> Um, so that was approved, uh, recommended for 75000 as well. Uh, and lastly, we have the town of Snowmass Village. Um, this is a uh, project that is uh, currently being represented by East West Partners. Um, and uh, Harry Teague Architects is doing the work. And so that owner group approached us with a uh, potential grant to help support this a uh, new building in Base Village, if it becomes the Discovery Center, that would be a uh, requirement of this grant uh, fund being approved. Uh, that was recommended for 50000 and the corporate board made it clear that would not go forward if the town did not occupy that space, and so that is a contingency on that grant. Is there a timeline on that question of if Snowmass does not occupy that space if it's how long is that extended would there be a need to refund the funds if it was potentially sold commercially in the future or something like that there wouldn't be a refund of funds the grant just wouldn't be approved and they have technically a two-year window to commence the, the work and I guess, I guess i'm thinking of after the work begins if oh. for some reason it, it's completed and then it doesn't continue as a discovery center and it's instead leased for commercial purposes or something else. Uh, You're saying three or four years down the line yeah, if it changes sort of use that it has to a private sector rather than the no. set down of snowmass. Yeah. So once it's under under construction, they could technically apply for a one year extension, which does get us to three years. Uh, so she's saying if after the fact you're done with the project, the money's been spent, that building changes from the discovery center to a sporting goods store. No. There's no payback. Well, but the, the, point, the point is that it has to be a uh, town of Snowmass Village. Correct. So regardless of the use, uh, it, it needs to remain under the town's ownership. 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 Okay. And so occupancy. Again, I'm just thinking more yeah, it things like went to the private maybe sector. that's appropriate. I just was wondering, you know, um, it, it, that the town cannot, what, what would happen if the town had a vote to decide to sell that center to a private business? But they would still control the building. They still own the building. They would. I'm saying if they chose to sell, sell the building. Sell the building. Well, well, then that those occupants would get the benefit. Okay. I have a question. Yes. And I can't. Re I can't. You know, I was on the core board for many years, many years ago, um, and I can't remember what we finally decided. It was a big discussion at some point about the use of the rent monies outside of the city of Aspen or Picking County because those jurisdictions weren't paying in. And from what I remember is that we supported using them outside of the city and the county in hopes of encouraging other jurisdictions to create their own ramp program and be part of our bigger, I mean, make our bigger, our program bigger. Has that ever been pursued recently? Are we still working on that? So we, we do discuss that quite a bit at the <laughs> core board. And what um, the funds are still allowed to be used, Aspen to Glenwood Springs, and all communities are members. They do pay into core as a member. Some of them have started their own similar program. The town of Basalt has a very similar rent program. They don't collect a lot of funds because, and, and they expanded it from the residential to the commercial sector um, when they updated their building code last year. Um, they don't they don't collect a lot of money. We are involved in how they spend that money. And then the town of Snowmass Village has their REOP program. It's the Renewable Energy Options Program. They have not seen a lot of funds collected into that program. In fact, we talked with the town manager and the assistant to the town manager about a month ago, and they have a, about $25,000 in that fund. So we're going to – we're working with them to look at, you know, is it because – People are mitigating on site, or are they allowing the funds, or are they making an administrative decision not to collect the funds, or what? Um, and what we have, we've been monitoring these dollars and what we see, and um, we could pull, pull some up. We have some charts that Marty pulled together after our core board meeting, is that about 70% of the funds stay in Aspen and Pitkin County. Of all the funds, not just the grant funds, but all the grant funds and all the rebate dollars stay in Aspen and Pitkin County. So if you have any interest in seeing these 
graphs that we have, we'd be happy to send them to you or display them or whatever. So I just wanted to see how they'd been furthered in the years since I've not been sitting on the core board. And I'm glad to hear it because it, it was really significant because when I was on the board, it was the first time we actually reached out to other jurisdictions at Valleywide because there were some great projects. And the bottom line was what we were doing with these dollars was helping the environment, be it in our own county or in, in the counties down the valley. So and I well, appreciate that. Oh, excuse me. And well, a couple, you know, the town of Carbondale doesn't have, they have a rent, they have a very strict building code that would generate rent funds, but typically people who built in Carbondale comply, they offset, but they do match almost one to one the amount of dollars that gets spent in the town of Carbondale with program funding from their, um, their severance tax dollars. And then the city of Glenwood right. Springs Utilities also has a rebate program that's similar, so. Right, great, thank you. I'm glad, I'm glad to hear that. Steve? Yeah, I had questions on funding also since our, our end of the funding mostly comes from the rent program. Hopefully, in the long term, the rent program will dry up and we won't get any more money from that because we hope the first year we created the won't be <laughs> building the big huge monster things or they're going to be offsetting their entire thing on site or through whatever, whatever means so I, i've been scratching my head trying to figure out if there's any other source of funding that we could develop um and you've described some that you know the matching funds from the different municipalities certainly would help but I, I do have an idea that I'd like to toss out as a, a, something to consider um, and would be sort of a pay it forward sort of a program where the people who get the grants put a small portion of the money that they save on their electric bill because they got this their project built and they would pay a small percentage of it into a fund which would be like a it's so it sort of would be like a revolving fund to help pay for future programs and so they're getting the benefit of the rent program now and then they would be putting a small portion of what they're saving into okay. the fund to pay for future projects so that would be a way that we could have an ongoing funding mechanism to you know, do future projects. Yeah, that's um, And then I also have another question on virtually, I mean, uh, almost everybody on the list didn't get the full amount that they're asking for. Are any of the projects in jeopardy of actually happening because they didn't get what they were requesting? I'll take that one. Yeah, <clears throat> uh, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, the easy and quick answer is yes. <laughs> um, you know, as you know, I mean, in construction, especially with uh, some of these types of projects that we scope, the efficiency work, the renewable side uh, is one of the first things to go uh, when budgets are constrained. And so that is a concern always with this program. And it's something we uh, sort of, I guess, grapple with every year. Um, so far, I don't have any red flags uh, as far as I'm communicating with these people quite frequently, and so far, so good. Um, one of the bigger ones was that Riverview School project was not going to move forward without Excel funds, and we knew this. Um, and so that was my, my, my big one. Obviously, the town occupying Discovery Center, if that happens, is, is another one. Um, but really no different than any other year in that regard. It always helps them to leverage other funds too, seeing that yes. and that's a huge part of it. Once we get our yeah. foot in the door to help them, then the other doors start to open. That's That's been our experience in the past. Several of these organizations use the core grant notification as a, as a, a door to open other, other funding opportunities, so. Mm -hmm. Any other questions on the two really grants? Quick one. Yes. Um, we are not, this is first reading, second reading is not until September 13th. It would be my understanding it's going to go to city council between now and then because we also need just so the public knows city council's on board with this so we need to have them weigh in before we do our final approval. that's correct yeah thank you okay let's move on to some actually you just asked if there are any other questions 
On, on, the, on the troop program, yes. Yeah, on the troop grants. In grades. general, uh, just kind of a broader, um, we know the local governments are members of CORE. What are the energy provider uh, members of CORE? Um, Holy Cross Energy and the City of Aspen Utilities. So Black Hills Energy has not become a partner. Um, as you know, we went from, used to be K&N Energy and then or Rocky Mountain Gas Kinder and then K&N <laughs> Energy and then uh, Source Morgan. Gas and then, yeah, Kinder Morgan and Source <laughs> yeah, yeah, Gas yeah, yeah, and yeah, Black yeah. Hills. We work with them in a different way though where we administer their, um, their assessment program and that's actually been a pretty successful partnership. And they're also, they've also been a partner on our High Five outreach and education program. So the, while they're not a direct member, we do have a good relationship with Black Hills Energy. That, that's good to know. And I was thinking um, Holy Cross is not uh, located just in Pickens County or Aspen. That's right. And so they expand through their membership outside of our reach as well. And I, I think it's a good unified effort for the Valley. So I appreciate that. That's Thank you. So the true grants are just one, one aspect of where the dollars go from ramp. And there's many other programs that CORE provides uh, for the community, which is, is included, so uh, that will be part of this approval as well. Yes, so just moving on, our other 2017, 2018 programs. So we continue, we also have a small community grant program, and we're requesting $50,000 for that this year. That's a program where somebody can seek support from 1000 to $10,000. I always liken it, sometimes it might be a conference sponsorship typically it's a project that can't get done it's not big enough to fit within the um, the true grants and the timing is not going to work and I think one of them most recently was the Aspen Historical Society mm -hmm. and we were able to help them do some remodeling of that building and help leverage again that helped leverage some additional funding for them so and we're requesting funding for design assistance grants again this year that's twenty five thousand dollars again that helps um, design buildings better how much is it going to cost to make a better building we have our REACH grant program. We're requesting $75,000 for that this year. Um, that's our income qualified program. And that, is, that funding gets leveraged with funding from the Energy Outreach Colorado program. We received $50,000 from them recently and we hope to receive another $50,000 or more in January. And what we've done with that program is we've expanded, and I just want to remind you that we've expanded, expanded it beyond Pitkin County into the Garf, or the excuse me, the Eagle County portion along 82 because we're able to leverage those Energy Outreach Colorado funds. And we now have served over 100 households in the last three years. Um, last year alone, we served, I think it was 47 households. So it continues to be a good program. And, and yeah, we want to continue that program. Then we have our Energy Smart program. That program continues to go. Um, we really kicked that off in 2010 with a grant from the Department of Energy for three counties. And that continues along uh, pretty well, really, in Pitkin Eagle. And now Gunnison's back on board again, which is great. But our funds just remain in the Roaring Fork Valley. So we use those funds to support assessments, residential assessments, residential rebates, our renewable energy program, our commercial program, and our commercial program continues to grow pretty robustly. And we have a person on staff, I mean, Marty helps Brad, but we have one person on staff who really goes after that program and works with large and small businesses to mitigate um, or to offset their renewal, their energy, so with that program. And then our other programs include climate action planning. As we've come to you and presented the emissions inventory for Pitkin County, we've also done emissions inventories for the town of Basalt. We updated the town of Snowmass Villages. We worked with the town of Carbondale. This year, what, and we spoke with you about this at a previous meeting with, the, with all of you, was to do some climate action planning within Pitkin County and figure out how do we move forward to set a goal for the county, an emissions, in, emissions reduction goal, and then how do we go about achieving that? So those are some funds um, there that we've requested. And then we have engagement and marketing. That continues to be the High Five program and how we outreach to the residents and businesses and promote our programs 
And then this year we've added $100,000 for new initiatives. Uh, in the core board, we discuss what we call the, the big idea. How can we really move the needle? What can we do? So, you know, two years ago, I think it was, we came back and requested half a million dollars for the Aspen Pitkin County Housing Authority, which we allocated and did some substantial upgrades to five, four properties. And um, this year we're requesting some funds. It's a to be determined how we would spend those funds, but it would be a concrete carbon emissions reduction activity. And of course, we'd come back to you, but like to request those funds now. Um, and then our, on the administrative side, we're requesting $190,000 for program management and $650,000 for program delivery, which brings us to a total request of $2,370,000 this year. And then, Mona, can you say um, how much is in the, in, in the bank, in the REMP account? Oh, yeah, and that's included. Thank you, George. There's $6,901,000 or six million nine hundred and one thousand dollars in the total REMP account, and those funds are collected annually, or I guess monthly, daily, <laughs> by the city and the county, and they're held by the city of Aspen, and the core board decided a few years ago, and this is Patty when you were probably there, that up to 30, a third of those funds could be requested to be spent, and we figure we should request that much um, because we have a lot of work to do. And then that leaves two-thirds in the bank in the event that we have uh, downturns in the economy again, and this way we can keep the program stable going forward. Yeah, and I think one of the, um, you know, one of the um, highlights um, that came from the DOE, the Department of Energy grant. I mean, that's really how that, how grants are supposed to be used. So, uh, as Mona said, we got that grant uh, several years ago to start the Energy Smart program uh, to kick that off, and we were not only successful in that, but we've been able to sustain that program on our own. And that's really what we hope how grants are used to to help help new initiatives, and then have those uh, organizations be able to continue those, sustain them on their own. And, and the Energy Smart program is one that has been a great success. And I'm happy to say that as a member of the Energy Smart Colorado Board, we have seven partners or six partners on board, and they additionally seek funding from their local jurisdictions and utilities so they can have their own programs. And as I mentioned, Gunnison County is coming back in with their program, and it's being supported by the Affordable Housing Program, and they have matching funds from the county commissioners this year, and which is really great to see. So we've got um, Summit, Eagle, Pitkin, um, Lake. Lake, Route, Gunnison. So, yeah, it's Good. nice to see. Moving along. Yeah. Uh, questions? On the overall budget or any part of it? I'll make a motion to approve. I'll make a motion to approve the 2017-2018 um, Renewable Energy Mitigation Program funding expenditures, including the 2018 Randy Udall, that's a good one to say, Energy Pioneer Grants, and the 2017-2018 core programs. This is first reading, except for public hearing, and second reading on September the 13th. Second. Second. Any further discussion? Rachel? Yeah, I just want to make a quick comment. I was at a Club 20 energy meeting last week in Summit County, or uh, maybe it was a week before, um, and uh, they had a speaker there about oil shale development and uh, just how to hold on to that potential because you never know. Uh, and uh, he quoted Randy Udall uh, <laughs> quite fondly and saying that uh, Randy always said that uh, oil shale is the energy of the future and always will be. <laughs> <laughs> that so, sounds just like and So I just want to throw that out there. And he'd Randy say it with that me. smile on his face. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, we have a motion and second. Great. If That's no great, further Rachel. discussion, all in favor say aye. 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 Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much. much. Thank you. Thank you See you in a couple weeks. All right. Yeah, in a while. <laughs> Okay, let's see. Next, uh, again, these are first readings set for public hearing on August 23rd. And the first is a resolution approving an intergovernmental agreement between Pitkin County and the City of Aspen 
in terminating any prior intergovernmental agreements regarding joint operations of their respective community development departments. What does all that mean? Can you explain this <laughs> to us? What does all that mean? <laughs> yes. Um, over the years, we've had shared resources because of our proximity uh, with who the are city you? of Aspen. Sorry, should I introduce who? myself first? Please. <laughs> Hi, Brian. the public. I'm Brian Paul. I'm the chief building official for Picking County. So. <laughs> um, yes, over the years, we've had shared resources on third floor of City Hall um, because we had a joint building with their ComDev department. Their building department moved out at one time, and then we were split with their planning and zoning department. But what the original IGA was was for cross coverage so that their inspectors could sometimes cover for our inspectors and we did away with that back in 2013 once we brought on our own electrical inspector we stopped some of that joint coverage um, to, to be able to use that salary money for our own position the rest of the IGA really is doing things like sharing bathroom supplies kitchen supplies paper on third floor the printers and a lot of that has kind of gone to the wayside too and we've started kind of separating those things too in anticipation of our moves to our separate buildings. So the primary change that's happening in this one is historically the city of Aspen um, controlled the contractor licensing side of contractor licensing and Picking County governed the best testing, which is just the test that a contractor takes to qualify to apply for a contractor's license. With the division of physical proximity we just felt like it made the most sense for one entity to kind of take on that role of doing both of those components so that a contractor didn't have to go two different places to start the process one to do the testing and one to do the the actual issuance of the license so through discussions between uh, Picking County staff and the city staff we talked about the best way to handle that and whether we divided it e equally or if one side took it and the city was capable of hiring another person to kind of govern that process and kind of run the, the whole best testing, which is time consuming um, because we have to schedule tests with um, CMC where the testing actually takes place. So the city this year actually wrote this IGA and took it to the council in January. So I'm a little behind getting it to the board for joint approval. But what we're bringing forward is the actual agreement that city council read through and both uh, Picking County and the city worked on as far as squaring away those changes to the, the intergovernmental agreement. In the future, we may not even have one once we're totally in separate buildings and all of this goes away, but we'll probably still have to have something governing the best testing so that the county keeps some authority to be able to go to um, revoke a license or to be able to have any say in a contractor's licensing. So. Questions? Yeah, that, my question was the dates because I noticed that Steve Scadron had cited on January 23rd, so you know it's always better to be late than never. So <laughs> I totally support moving this forward. Thank you for bringing it to us, Rachel. Uh, let me ask: um, How does this integrate with uh, things such as our updated energy and building code, and how will potentially new requirements or standards that a contractor must know be incorporated into the testing for the licensure? Good question. We kept in the IGA the language about trying to stay in line with our adoption process and try to coordinate those adoptions so that they happen in the same year. Like we both adopted the 2015 codes. We'll both probably adopt the 2021 codes. And we did some cooperative efforts to try to keep those in line. There are just some discrepancies because of different philosophies and, and two different boards making, helping make decisions. Sure. So we aren't perfectly in line, but we do try to keep that continuity between the city and the county. And the testing will all be based on the same code that we both adopted. Those tests aren't so specific to our regional area. They're, they're kind of a, a national test. And so it's, it's pretty easy to be consistent with the testing part of it and the licensing portion of it. The nice thing is, like I said, we kept the ability for us, if we have a problem with someone's license and the city maybe, maybe doesn't, we can still, as the county, uh, have recourse against that. So. And again, just more general about this entire process of licensing contractors, um, uh, how often do contractors need to renew? Uh, they renew every three years. Every currently. three years. And so that would seem to me to also be an opportunity to perhaps uh, hand them a packet of information that said these are the updates to the code which we've uh, seen since your last um, exam. 
Definitely, yes. And we could demonstrate that disparity if they're going to work in the city compared to where they're, if they're going to work in the county, for sure. Thank you for that. Sure. Steve? I want to know if there was an incident about microwaving fish sticks <laughs> on the third floor of the city hall. There was. That led to them putting this little bit of levity into the And they the were RGA. adamant about keeping it in this version, this revision, because it was such a I stink. I focus on the dates. I missed the fish stick. Yes, there was a fish stick incident. So they did away with fish sticks, fish products, uh, broccoli. Uh, they didn't do Brussels sprouts, which I was surprised, but they chose, chose a few foods that couldn't be cooked. On Is that floor. why it still <laughs> smells fishy up there? <laughs> <laughs> I can't answer that. Well, was it their fault or was it ours? I don't remember who that. the culprit was. <laughs> I, I, I do not recall. <laughs> Interlooper. Okay. It was those guys from the second floor that sent <laughs> Possibly. Us there. Any like further motion? questions? Please. Okay. Um, I would make a motion to approve the resolution approving an intergovernmental agreement between Pickens County and the City of Aspen, terminating any prior intergovernmental agreements regarding joint operations of their respective community development departments. Uh, that's, that's the motion. I'll second. For and set for public hearing on uh, August the 23rd. Further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Thanks, Brian. Thanks, Thank Brian. you very much. <laughs> Fish sticks on the Okay, next, uh, again, first reading set for public hearing on August 23rd. This is a resolution appropriating budget for the Colorado Department of Health Care Policy and Financing Grant for Be Well Mental Health Systems Coordination. And we had a work session on this yesterday. Hi, I'm Connie Baker, Pickett County Budget Director, and we're here today with the first <coughs> reading of a budget resolution to increase the county's expenditure budget by $24,509, and then also increase the revenue budget by an equal amount, $24,509. So there's no net impact to either the general fund or the public health fund. Uh, this was the grant that was received from HIPPUF, for mental health, we are appropriating half of the grant as the grant covers the last half of 2017 and then into the first half of 2018. And we will be budgeting the second half of the grant in the 2018 budget process, which is upcoming shortly in the fall. And I'll let Karen mention a word about the program itself that sure. the grant is funding. As we, this is Karen Kenneman, Pickin County Public Health Director, and as we talked about yesterday, this is a, a funding opportunity for us to look at looking at systems level coordination around mental health within the community. So, um, having a coordinator on contract, working through um, fragmentation with our mental health system, everything from prevention to aftercare, and ensuring that mental health providers are able to collaborate, that they have support, that they have some shared metrics that we're looking at um, helping them to design and really creating less of a fragmentation around the organizations as well as for folks that might be falling through the cracks throughout the mental health system. Mental health was prioritized with the community health improvement plan that happened five years ago. It was also one of the key indicators that came up in the Pickens County Community Survey as a place where community members just felt like we weren't doing enough. And so this coordination will hopefully allow us to um, help our providers to really work together um, throughout the community to support mental health. Questions? No, I'd like to make a motion to approve because this is something we've needed for quite a while. Um, just so, um, again, not not only so we have people in need of mental health services that aren't falling through the gaps, but it's so that the providers of mental health services are not falling through the gaps. So, um, so we can better utilize what we have to offer here in the valley, and and it makes much better sense for for the use of the people's time and energy and dollars. So, um, I'll make a motion to approve and set for a public hearing on um, August the twenty third. I'll second. Any further discussion? Steve? Um, I just wanted to bring out the the issue we talked about yesterday in our work session, and, and I had been asking questions about how can we have cost savings down the road on this or to, to be able to pay for this. 
and the point was brought out that we don't anticipate that down the road there will be cost savings, but there will be a great improvement in public service provided. And that's really what we're trying to achieve here is to, you know, deal with the mental health issues in the community in the most efficient way that we can and to provide better service to the community. And I think that that's an important point to bring out for the public's benefit. Thanks, Steve. Well, thank you. Uh, with that, all in favor say aye. 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 Thank you, ladies. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Uh, we're moving on to our em emergency ordinance. This is a, the second con confirmatory reading. <clears throat> it's an emergency ordinance authorizing the board to enter into a communications use lease with the U.S. Department of Agricultural Forest Service for the Sunlight Communications site. And Kara had a conflict, so I've been temporarily promoted to fill her shoes. Uh, well, good luck. This one, I know. <laughs> Uh, so what's in front of you is a confirmatory reading of an emergency ordinance that the board passed back on July 26th. And it really takes into account a, a um, new lease arrangement with the United States Forest Service for use of Sunlight Mountain for uh, TV um, translator services, but more importantly, uh, our digi digitally trunked radio system for our public safety entities as well as broadband for backhaul. What the lease does, this was one of our original uh, communication lease sites, uh, dates back to 1961, as does most of the equipment that's currently uh, on the site. So uh, what this lease uh, takes into account is uh, updating that equipment and so it involves the construction of a new 11 foot by 22 foot equipment shelter um, the construction of one 120 foot self-supporting um, three-legged tower so there's no guy wires in that um, minor relocations of utilities and it also anticipates the removal of the existing shelter, which is 10 foot by 20 foot, and three guy wire towers that are each 100 feet. So we're removing three 100 foot tall towers uh, that are supported by guy wires and, and building one 120 foot uh, tower uh, to provide not only the existing translator services, but also to upgrade our public safety radio to digitally trunked radio, as well as um, to uh, complete the loop for our uh, middle mile broadband project. There are no changes from the first reading. The board did ask for um, clarification on three items, so I'll just go over those uh, real quick. Um, the first was on how the rental fees were based. Um, this is in your packet, but the, uh, for the United States Forest Service rental schedule, the, the rental schedule is determined by the population served and the highest valued commercial use. Typically right now that is tied to uh, wireless internet providers. Um, we, we were we don't have any commercial use at Sunlight at this time, but we anticipate that we will in the future as our broadband project comes on. We do on Elephant, and the rate there was $2,300, so there will be some, some calculation, but it's not a um, typically a, a, a large sum. There's also concern about um, whether the tower was within the um, flight path and whether there would be any um, lighting or, or particular markings. Um, staff did check into that. The site is not within the flight path and won't require any special uh, lighting or markings. And then there, there was a question about lightning. You know, how do we proof the uh, tower, especially one of this size, 120 feet um, for lightning? There are standard grounding protocols for communication sites that protect both people um, either in the structure or around the tower sites. 
and also that protect the equipment from power surges. Um, we will be following those protocols in those cases to be sure that that tower site is properly grounded. Um, we will need more expertise at the table to explain what that is, though, if, if you have further questions. But those were the three questions outstanding from the last. Patty? And it's my understanding the reason why this was an emergency ordinance was because of the time frame we needed to start construction so we could hopefully get all this done before we have snow. That's correct. And so this allowed us, um, by having the um, emergency, it, it takes some time to get these lease agreements with our, our federal partners. And, and so we wanted to be sure that we could nail down these design requirements with this board so that we could complete design. We anticipate with um, right now, uh, we will be in construction um, by the third week of August, uh, right. third or fourth week of August on this site and we'll have it completed um, before the site becomes inaccessible due to weather. Thank you. Good. Other questions? I'll make a motion to approve on second reading. This is the confirmatory hearing for an emergency ordinance um, allowing the board to Picking County, Colorado, authorizing the board to enter into a communication use agreement with the Forest Service for the Sunlight Communication Site. I'll second that. Any further discussion? I just would like to thank um, the full staff and Cara in particular for pulling all this together and moving it forward so quickly. Great. All in favor say aye. 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 Thank you. Uh, we're going to move on to our land use public hearings. Would the board like to take a short break yes, before? Yes, yeah. Ten minute break, work. 10 minute break, grassroots. Should I start over? No, just continue. <laughs> All right. The, the, 
The appellants are John and Molly Morton, represented by Tom Smith, and they're present here today. Uh, Matthew Patel is the applicant and owner of Parcel 3, West Sopris Ranch, um, and he is represented by Luke Bamberger and Chris Croy. Um, Chris Bryan. Chris. <laughs> um, Matthew Patel isn't here today, um, so they're going to represent him in his place. Um, and just to note, um, the criteria for an an appeal, um, as quoted in the land use code, is not a de novo consideration of the merits of development application that gave rise to the appeal. The appeal body shall only reverse, re modify, or remand a decision on an appeal if it finds that there have been clear and demonstrable errors, abuse of discretion, or denial of procedural due process in the application of the facts in the record to the standards of the land use code. Um, so this. This appeal process is slightly different than some of the other um, land use matters that you guys hear. So, so it's it's not within our role here today to question uh, any of the land use approvals or discussions. It's only here our role only here is to determine whether the hearing officer uh, abused her discretion or, and or made clear and demonstrable errors in approving the application but we're not to refer back to or try to address or make any changes or question any of the actual land use approvals. That is correct. I don't know if, if I do you want to? Yeah, that's correct, George. Okay. okay. George, can I ask yes. just real quick just to clear this up before we get further into this? We were just handed an email just now from William Bernstein, mm -hmm. and I it, it appears that he felt that the board had already made our minds up. And I've, I've you corrected that. that. Well, just yeah. so the public knows, it's because the, resol the, mm -hmm. the resolution that you put in, the determination you put in here was for denial. It doesn't mean we have to approve that one. We can go anywhere. I just want to clear that up. We have not made up our minds. Exactly. We are here, Correct. Yep. clear minds to make a decision <laughs> today. Correct. Okay, so in, in order to keep this discussion organized, I'm going to just provide a brief background on the parcel and the application. Um, next, the appellants will have a chance to voice their, their comments, followed by the applicant, and then we'll hear any comments from the public at that time. So the subject parcel, like I said, is Parcel 3 West Sopris Ranch, um, and that's located in this L-shaped parcel here. It's accessed from West Sopris Creek Road um, to Stone Road and from Stone Road um, off of Skookum Lane. Um, it is contains 35.14 acres and is zoned RS30. Um, the West Sopris Ranch parcels were created in 1974 pursuant to the state's 35-acre subdivision exemption and are and are not part of a county approved subdivision. No productive covenants, um, covenant agreement or HOA um, governs these parcels. Um, the property has received multiple approvals since um, beginning in 1995, including most recently an administrative decision in 2014, which reestablished an activity envelope approved in 2011. Um, what has changed since that time is a lot line adjustment between parcels two and three. So this is parcel three, the subject parcel. This is parcel two. And so a lot line adjustment was done um, this past year. Um, with that lot line adjustment, the applicant um, submitted in December an application for a new activity envelope. Um, George, can I ask that lot line adjustment occurred without the OCC because of the 35 acre subdivision process? is this area right here. The applicant proposed a new access corridor, which is the 
this more S-like access over there. Um, an objection to the application was submitted this past January by John and Molly Morton. Uh, due to the objection, <coughs> the application was heard at a public hearing before Pickett County Hearing Officer Sarah Oates on April 18th, 2017. At the public hearing, the hearing officer found that the application complied with all the applicable provisions of the land use code um, and approved the applicant's request subject to conditions. Um, some of those conditions actually amended the proposed activity envelope and um, based on those conditions what was approved shown here in green um, and in summary what she had conditioned was that the proposed activity envelope omit some of the areas in containing slopes in excess of 30 percent which is this area here um, and she also conditioned that the applicant maintain the prior approved access envelope um, here All right. so based on that approval like I said the the appellants um, are appealing the hearing officer determination to Dash 2017 based on the following reasons. Um, number one, the hearing officer improperly considered and improperly applied scenic view protection criteria in approving the activity envelope. Two, the hearing officer improperly approved the access activity envelope. Three, a substantial amount of land within the proposed activity envelope with slopes less than 15 percent are within the 100 foot front yard setback and the hearing officers determination fails to prohibit construction of structures within the 100 foot front yard setback for the hearing officers determination fails to consider and address the goals of the Emma caucus master plan to pervert to preserve the scenic views and privacy of the neighbor neighboring par properties <laughs> five the approval is inconsistent with the prior approvals granted by the county for development on the subject parcel um, and as Patty noted, I did just pass out two letters that were just submitted yesterday to community development from, from neighbors um, voicing their comments that didn't get in the packet still. So. Uh, staff does not believe that the hearing officer abused discretion or made clear and demonstrable errors in the application of the facts in the record to the standards of the land use code. Um, staff recommends that the BOCC deny the appeal by John and Molly Morton and affirm the hearing officer's determination to 2017 subject to the attached resolution. So if you guys have questions on, on the, just like the background. Yeah, I just have a question on the first page of the memorandum um, underneath appeal criteria and procedure. It says the effective date of the hearing officer determination was September 1st, 2017. Um, no, I'm not sure how, how that if that's just supposed to be deleted from the memo. I'm going. Wait, we haven't. We're not there yet. Um, yeah, I'm not sure what's going on there. So uh, yeah, it could have just. <laughs> okay, so we'll just we'll just delete yeah, that out of yeah. there. I just want to make sure because I think the hearing officer's determination was in April, correct? Okay, that's what I thought. So I was just. Yeah, yeah, I apologize for that. I just want you to know I read it. <laughs> Other questions? Yeah. Rachel? Thank you. Um, Tammy, there's uh, a lot of discussion in the memos and the briefs we have in front of us about uh, activity envelope, scenic view, and then site plan review. Mm -hmm. uh, can you please help differentiate uh, the difference between uh, a scenic area protection and site plan review mm -hmm. and it, what are the next steps for this application should it go forward after today's hearing? Okay, so the scenic view protection areas have been designated throughout the county and they're basically the major um, transportation corridors, one being West Soper's Creek Road. And so with that, 
that if you're in one of those corridors, you have additional standards that you need to comply with, such as ridgeline review and um, other scenic standards. Um, and that review is done at site plan, typically. And, and typically, a lot of the applications that we see are site plan and activity envelope reviews together. Now, applicants always have the opportunity to do an activity envelope review separate from a site plan. And those reviews differ in that, right, an activity envelope is just establishing that envelope of approximate area where development can occur. We don't see the details like floor plans and where the septic's going to go and all the details that go into that site planning application. Um, and right, traditionally with that, we do the scenic view protection review. Now, um, because there had been several previous reviews done on this parcel, and through some of those previous reviews, it was determined by staff and some of the neighbors that this parcel um, was in a scenic view corridor and would have um, um, constraints due to some of the ridgeline um, features behind it. So it, 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 they wanted to make sure that the county addressed that and was approving an envelope that, that could comply with those standards. Um, but it's right, the, the appellants are arguing that it was inappropriate to um, address those standards at activity envelope review. Okay, and then just a little more uh, generically, at uh, site plan review of any application, uh, are you able to deny a certain design or layout um, if they're unable to accomplish the the requirements of not breaking a ridge line or other site uh, other scenic values? Right. Exactly. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions at this time for Tammy for staff? All right, don't go far. All right, we'll turn it over. Uh, we'll have the, uh, the, the appealants. Down a little if um, huh? I can figure it out. Where'd you find that map? <laughs> <laughs> it was in <laughs> deep. I know. That was like the most useful one I could see. So, a lot of fuzzy maps. <laughs> I don't even know what page it was no, somewhere. I mean, we'll just look at just hold it in. So attachment D. Good afternoon, commissioners. Uh, my name is Tom Smith. I'm a lawyer. My office is in Basalt. And I'm here on behalf of Molly and John Morton, who are here behind me, who are neighbors who own Lot 4, which is to the west, immediately west of the applicant's property. And we have filed this appeal opposing the approval granted by the hearing officer. And um, my presentation, of course, relates to that. Um, what I would like to do is um, elaborate, first elaborate a bit on the standard of review because I think that's very important. Uh, then set the factual framework for what we're dealing with here. and. Uh, have you take a look at some of the photographs that um, we have that uh, show the properties, their proximity to one another, uh, the um, uh, K 
key geographic topographical features that are involved. And then I'll present my argument on the issues of concern to us and the reasons why we think the uh, hearing officer was in error. And, and when I'm done, the, the Mortons will have a few things I'd like to, to say to you also, okay? So first on the standard of review, um, you have a letter dated July 21 from Chris LaCroix, who is uh, Chris Bryant's partner, uh, stating that uh, our appeal is uh, based on an abuse of discretion or, or that the standard of review based on abuse of discretion, clear and demonstrable error, and that we're in fact asking you to engage in de novo review, that is not correct. We, are, we understand that the appeal is before you based on the record. Our arguments are based on the record and they're based on the applicable law. Now, there are two parts, as has been recited, and I'm sorry to have to get into some of these technical legal issues, but I think if you understand it, you'll understand our position a little better uh, and why we think there was an error that uh, should cause you to reverse the hearing officer's decision. So there are two separate factors in your code that justify a reversible error. One is an abuse of discretion. And the second is clear and demonstrable error. <coughs> now, uh, Mr. LeCloy's read letter cites to a Colorado Supreme Court case on the standard of review. Um, but when, it, when a decision, when an appeal of one of your decisions is made to court, the standard under the applicable rules is slight, is somewhat different than what's stated in your code. For judicial review of your final decision, if that were to happen, and when it happens in other cases, as you know, the one basis for overturning the decision is an abuse of discretion, and the other is the, uh, that you have exceeded your jurisdiction. And within exceeded your jurisdiction is the requirement that you ha have to follow the law. And there's a difference between abuse of discretion and the requirement that you follow the law. Abuse of discretion means weighing the evidence, okay? So if there's a dispute about whether a property is located in a wildfire, wildlife hazard or not, and one expert says it is and one expert says it's not, and the hearing officer goes with one or the other, that's weighing the evidence, and that's where abuse of discretion comes in. And in those kinds of cases, all that's required is that there be some competent evidence in the record to support the decision that was made. But when we're talking about not following the rules, that's different. That doesn't have to do with a dispute of fact. It has to do with compliance with applicable laws. Now, in the courts, as I mentioned, it's called uh, exceeded your jurisdiction. That phrase isn't used in your code. Instead, your code talks about um, clear and demonstrable error. So since you've got two different things in there, abuse of discretion and then clear and demonstrable error, it's our position that it's clear and demonstrable error if you don't follow, if the hearing officer hasn't followed your own rules. Because it's got to mean something other than weighing the evidence and an abuse of discretion in that sense. So this is very important because it is our position that the rules have not been followed in this case and that code compliance has not been demonstrated because of uh, the decision is inconsistent with your code, okay? And I'll, we'll get into that. But first, I want to make sure we set the record straight here on, on this. Uh, it's difficult for you to understand the property and how, the, how this plays out um, in the real world, just looking at maps and without being out on the property. And I understand you can't do that, but I think it's important that I do the best I can to help you understand what's actually involved here. Now, um, we're actually dealing with four activity envelopes here. We have a existing approved building site, activity envelope for a building site, and an existing approved driveway alignment. And we also have a proposed new building site, building activity envelope, 
and a new proposed driveway. So those are four different things. And using this map, it's not complete, it's not, doesn't show exactly um, what the existing approved building envelope is, but the south line of that uh, existing envelope goes across this former property line, and then it goes up north this way, and then west, and it goes out about in here. It's not quite up to that uh, boundary, that line there, and it comes, it comes across here and then comes back down. And this is the boundary, this north-south line here, a little trouble showing it here, is, is the boundary between the Morton's property and, and the Patel's, Patel's property. The proposed new activity envelope is essentially, it, it includes part of what was in the previously approved activity envelope to the extent that it's north of this old property line. But it also now includes property added to it as a result of the lot line adjustment as shown here. Now, as Tammy has mentioned, that lot line adjustment didn't get county approval. And Patty asked the question, she's right. It didn't require county approval. But it's important that we point out that that means that, you know, Mr. Patel can't claim that because he did a lot line adjustment, he's entitled to anything. The lot line adjustment did not, in other words, represent a, a land use planning decision by the county of any kind. And there's no implication that it means there's an entitlement to build in this area in any way, okay? He was entitled to do it. We're not saying it was illegal, but it doesn't carry with it any presumptions. Now, the old driveway alignment, as you can look at this old map here, this, there is a, easement across the Morton's property for access to the Patel lot, the north part of, of Patel's lot here, the old, which was in the original lot. This is, you know, one of those funky things that was done back in the day. This, this subdivision did not get county approval. And it was this, the access to this lot, which has never been previously developed, um, came across east-west into the, across the lot line and into the property. And that, that was approved with the prior approvals. Now this property has had approve, approved activity envelopes for 17 years. And then the Mortons are okay with that. They're okay with what's been previously approved. They're not objecting to the development of this property. But it's our position that the um, application, the approval of the application, has dramatic, unanticipated, unpredicted in impacts on their property, inconsistent with the development in the area, and more importantly, does not, the applicant hasn't shown that it meets code. So, looking over here at access, you can see that th this, this, is the old, this is the old previously approved access that takes you to the property line here, okay? And that's fine, no objection there. And that was, but that was, uh, the applicant originally proposed an access that would come in way up here and traverse a ridge here, instead of being down in the valley, then planning staff recommended against that. Why? Because it had, has dramatic impacts on the environment, on this hillside and the natural environment and potential impacts on wildlife and all that. Now, it's really important to note that this is high desert country. This is not evergreens, aspen trees, cottonwood trees. It's sage, scrub oak, and you know, that's it. And we've seen plenty of, we have seen plenty of examples throughout the county where the development of roads in those areas leave scars on the landscape that never recover. And we agree with, for that reason, with the disapproval of what was proposed here for access to the property and use of the old access, which is shown here coming into the lot. Now, one thing that Tammy didn't mention 
that's very important, very important here, is the extension of that previously approved driveway, which would go from here and down into this point here, which is shown as the terminus of the driveway into the new proposed new activity envelope. Now, originally, this applicate the applicant was basing this change on a claim that the proposed new building site was less constrained than the currently approved one in terms of steep slopes. Well, that was pretty clearly debunked on the record when you did the analysis, which shows that there's a lot more flat land up in here that was already in the approved activity envelope than there is down here at the terminus of this driveway, which leads you into this little bitty area here for development, okay? Now, one of the, well, let me, let me present you with a couple other things, if I could, that are important to show what we're dealing with here. Um, we have some, there are photographs in the record. I'm looking for my copies. That um, are in black and white. They look like this. And I have some color copies to distribute to you of some of these. And I'll hand them out to you one at a time. Make sure I have enough for that. I was just going around the back side with all the wiring we have, Tim. Uh, and, yeah, yeah. Let's give it to Jeanette and we'll move and it around. Just, just, and we can move it. We'll, we'll move it around, Tim. So what this photograph shows is that is a, there's a, you can see the trail, and this is from generally um, within the area of, taken from generally within the area of the previously approved activity envelope. And what you're looking at is a ridge line. And on some of the maps it's shown as the ridge line of concern. And you can't really get the full sense of it from the slope mapping that you're looking at on the projector. The proposed new activity envelope is on the other side of the ridge that's shown here. So you got to get around that ridge. And getting around that ridge means extending the driveway. And it's that extension of the driveway that we object to for a number of different reasons that I'll explain. Um, I'm going to give you a second photograph, which also shows the ridge line. If you just give them to Jeanette, she can walk them around. Fine. First. Fine. And this photograph. Oh, I need one for when you're done, Jeanette, for the applicants. This photograph is taken from a viewing platform that is on <laughs> Patel property. The viewing platform is within the previously approved activity envelope. However, it is not necessarily the place within the approved activity envelope where you would build on, the, on that approved activity envelope. But what's important to see here is, again, this is the same ridge line, and that ridge line has to be crossed from um, the approved driveway, has to get to the other side of that ridge. The third 
uh, photograph. These are all on the record, but they're not in the record in color because they were copied for everybody. Well, these are much more readable. So these are much you. more legible and yeah. I think clear because they're color. So this photograph is, I believe, taken from the top of the ridge that we're talking about, and it shows the area of the proposed activity envelope on the other side of the ridge, and it shows the Morton's house. And the construction of a house in this area would be totally inconsistent with anything that you see in the West Sopras Ranch subdivision, and you can see the obvious proximity of the two. Now, originally, as I said, the um, the applicant's uh, pitch on this was that this was a less constrained site. But it was basically admitted at the Emma Caucus meeting and uh, that the reason for the proposed change is for Mr. Patel to get a better view on Mount Sobers. That's it. That's why, what this is about. Um, the fourth photograph Again, shows uh, what you've done. Thank you. Yeah, yes, I will. Who took these photographs? Pardon me? Who took the photographs? Did you have permission from the Patels to go on their property to take these photographs? I don't think anybody had permission to go on anybody else's property. Okay, I'm not just, sure that's just an was issue. Wondering. Um, so this photograph shows that, again, it's a blow up, but it shows you that there's an unobstructed view between the proposed activity envelope and the Morton's residence. And this is totally out of character with any other development in the West Sopras Ranch. You can't see other homes. They don't have this kind of proximity unless there are landforms to screen them, and that is not the case here. And the potential for landscaping or other uh, vegetation to screen is uh, it's inconceivable in this kind of, a, in this kind of country. Now, we have, and then finally, there's one other photograph that I'd like to get you that um, is from a different perspective. I have not this with me. I have enough for everybody. This one's a duplicate. We can stack these like this. I can't figure out you know, when you're on here, what's... I know. Because I don't know where their house is. Do we? That's going to be a question. Where's the Morton's house yeah. on relation mm -hmm. on the must be over here? Okay. Can I share this? Sure. Yeah. Okay. So, Tim, can, can you, these pictures are great, but can you show me on this map where the Morton's house is? It's off the map. Yes. And is it, is it off the map? Yeah, no? it's Do you want to point it out? Just, just give on. me a basic general. It's, it's in the big white area to the you left. Put your finger on it. Yeah. Oh, screen. Okay. Okay. Screen. I don't know how to use this. Just just on, just on the picture. On the picture. Uh, just look. Right, right <laughs> there. Okay. So it gives me some ideas to where we're looking from the. So this is. A photograph taken from the junction of what East and West Opus Creek Road, and it's 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 a, it's in part deceiving because it doesn't show you the distance between the ridge we're talking about and the Morton's house, and it, so it doesn't show 
that part of the proposed activity envelope. But you can see right below the, in, in the photograph below the Morton's house is, that, is the ridge line that has to be crossed with the new driveway to get to the proposed activity envelope. But below, you're saying? No, above. Okay, that's what you said below. Okay, I'm sorry. Above. The, uh, well, it, below the, what's there, where their house is shown, but above that ridge that is right in front of their house, you've got to get across that ridge. So, yeah, maybe put windows on there and then show us. As you can see, the viewing platform here. Yes, that is that's part of the act of the previously approved activity envelope, but there is land behind that that you can't see where that where there's some screening from the topography. This proposal, or or I'm I'm sorry, this map shows. It's hard for me to keep this folded. The, the ridge I'm talking about is this one. It comes here, comes across here. And that has to be crossed to get to the proposed activity envelope on the other side. Okay? So it's our position that that driveway extension is going to be highly visible as a road cut from West Sopers Creek Road that that hasn't been considered. So let me, let me then address the two, the, the two main issues that are of concern to us. One of the findings of the hearing officer was that the, let me get to my right page of notes. I have. The staff, the staff report states that it was appropriate for the staff in the county to consider scenic view plane protection criteria compliance in connection with this activity envelope application. The code says otherwise. What your code says, and it was also stated in the prior approvals, is that compliance with scenic view protection standards will be considered at site plan review. That's clearly what the code says. And yet, in this case, the, the staff said it was appropriate to determine, well, because they didn't want to approve, have an activity envelope approved that could not comply with the implication that the currently approved activity envelope could not comply. That, there is zero evidence to show that that's the case. And there is zero evidence to support the statement by the hearing officer, and I quote, consideration of the map scenic view protection area as, as viewed from West Sopers Creek Road by the Community Development Department as part of this application was appropriate to confirm compliance with the plan, meaning the comprehensive plan, and the code. Well, as I say, the code says otherwise. The code says you consider it at, a, at site plan review. Now, we're not raising this as a technical question of the stage at which it is appropriate to consider site plan review criteria in isolation from the, the facts and circumstances that we're dealing with. The problem here is that, that that consideration was not applied in accordance with the requirements of the code. The only thing that was done was that a couple of story poles were put up. And on that basis, this determination was made that the approved activity envelope is a problem and the new one is not. But the information is entirely incomplete and, do, and it isn't, doesn't have in it, the application doesn't have in it, the information the code requires to make that determination. Additional information required is building location within the activity envelope. That's not, there's no evidence of that. Building size and height, there's no evidence of that. 
Elevation drawings showing building facades, materials, color, and texture. Again, no information. Preliminary landscape plans, no information. So the consideration of scenic view protection criteria at this stage was not only procedurally incorrect, but wholly incomplete if, in fact, a decision should be made at all based on those considerations. The, there, it, there is no, nothing in the record to suggest that the current building activity envelope, uh, building within that, can't meet code criteria. The prior approvals referred to a 20-foot height limit in order to address scenic uh, considerations. That's no longer a code requirement because of the uh, detail that's now uh, applicable with scenic view protection criteria. But it is within the county's discretion to impose a 20-foot height limit. In fact, there are other structures in the county and in this area as well where such a height limit has been imposed. So all that we got here was 28-foot story poles, which, as far as we're concerned, to tell you very little about the ability to build within the existing access or uh, the existing activity envelope. Now, uh, the second major issue has to do with the extension of the uh, access activity envelope. The, um, that envelope is, that access driveway is nothing more than lines on a map. Okay, you have in the record, um, and I don't have copies of this, but you have in the record the um, the proposed alignment of a driveway. And when we did the site visit and we're out in the field, the, the first part of it that takes you to the property line is very clear because there's basically, it's basic, there's a pathway that takes you to that property line in this area. In, to right here. This part of it that comes across is pretty clear. But the extension in the field, it's not been flagged. And when we walked it in the field with the hearing officer, the applicant could not say where that driveway is in the field. They could not locate it in the field. Now, why is that important? Well, it's important for two reasons. And one of them is that without a precise location for that act, uh, access activity envelope and other information, you, uh, the applicant hasn't shown that the requirements of the, of the code are satisfied. The code requires that, in, uh, in, that all applications, quote, must show preliminary grading for access, Drive access drive alignment, demonstrating the driveway can be done in conformance with driveway standards contained in the Pitkin County Asset Management Plan. That there is no information, no information on that. Now, if you look at the slope mapping and the... Uh, Tom, can you tell us what section of the code you just cited? 2.1.1, Pitkin County Land Use Application Manual. Okay, thank you. The, the slope mapping, and I don't have, do we, do we have additional copies? Is it in our packet? If you just give us, a, we all have packets. In okay, I don't have a page number, I wish I did. But, I'm sorry about that. I'm sorry I didn't bring additional copies of this. But, Nick Aday, who is the only expert who testified, said that the information was wholly insufficient to meet the criteria that I just mentioned. And he also stated that the slope mapping through GIS, which is what this driveway alignment is based on, is not wholly accurate unless and until you get out in the field and survey it and locate it. And the staff concurred with that, that in, on the record, that the slope mapping that you get with GIS is not entirely accurate. 
Well, in some cases, it doesn't matter if it's entirely accurate or not. But in this case, it does. And that's because if you look at this line on the map, it's shown, look up, this is close to an excess of 30% right here. Right? If the driveway is off by a little bit, it's going to be in the steep slope. Same thing here. Okay? Now, this is a ridge line. And somehow, you've got to get to the other side of the ridge down here to build. And when we tried to determine out in the field where this turns, the applicant couldn't tell us. And we're convinced that this lack of information is hugely significant because there could be a giant scar on this hillside that will be visible from West Sopers Creek Road. Now, it seems to me what's good for the goose is good for the gander. If you're going to take, make a, a grant, uh, allow preliminary considerations of scenic view in determining what's an appropriate building site activity envelope, the same thing ought to apply to the driveway. And yet that wasn't considered at all. And given the inability to locate it in the field, the no preliminary grading, I mean, literally, all we have on this is this line on the map. And that doesn't meet code. And it's significant because if we proceed under the assumption that this is an approved driveway ac access activity envelope, that means something. It carries some weight. It means this is where you can build your road. <coughs> and we don't think that should have been approved, certainly not without the information. One of the statements made by the applicant at the hearing about the driveway extension was, and I quote, we don't want to leave a big scar in the landscape. Obviously, we're going to have to put drive access through without telling us where. But we'll be conscious of trying to mitigate that, maybe through landscaping. Well, I'm sorry, folks. Landscaping is not an answer in this kind of country, as you can see from the mapping, or the photographs, rather. This is not a place where you can plant aspen trees, cottonwoods, and evergreens, because there's no irrigation. This is high and dry country. Land if, this drive if that access drive extension is built, it's going to be a scar on the landscape, period, end of story. And it wasn't considered, and it wasn't considered because th there was no uh, requirement to comply with the requirements of the code on that driveway access alignment. Without that driveway access alignment, you can't get to the proposed access activity envelope uh, or the proposed building act activity uh, envelope. And we think that the approval of the driveway and the access activity envelope, the reason I've said, did not, uh, the hearing officer did not consider appropriately the requirements of the code and that therefore it was clear and demonstrable error for that approval to have been granted in this case. The answer is not to defer all these issues to site plan review. Activity envelope approval means something and the requirements of the code should be enforced in this case. Now, John, Molly, do you have some comments you want to make? Thank you, Tom. I'm John Martin, and this is my wife, Molly, and we're the owners of Lot 4, Parcel 4, adjacent to Lot 3. And um, I used to live in Aspen in the 90s and moved up to Montana and got the U curse and came back in <laughs> 2012 
and bought this property. Um, it's unique, it's sacred, it's very private. The closest house to ours visually is about a mile away across all the way West Sopras uh, Mountain Ranch. And we can see, once we get on top of that ridge, uh, or near there, we can see Emma, we can see the, the, the uh, houses in uh, Emma from our hot tub, and that's almost three miles, three or four miles away. So I'm not as good as Tom or any of these uh, other guys, so I have to read some of my stuff to get it accurate. Is that okay? Sure. And here's sort of part of our feelings. Uh, this approval of the amended Patel activity envelope on lot three of West Sopras Ranch subdivision by hearing officer Sarah Oates on April 18th, 2017, to us is a bold attempt to completely invalidate 17 years of previous BOCC administrative decisions approving an activity envelope on lot three, starting with resolution 192 in 2000, Administrative Decision 60 in 2011, and Administrative Decision 83 in 2014, all based on the false assumption from the staff memo to, member, uh, staff memo to the hearing officer and Patel application that a residential home built on the approved envelope would be substantially challenged or could not be built on uh, upon uh, that lot at all. These decisions were of vital importance to Molly and me when we purchased parcel four. In each of these decisions, as Tom just mentioned briefly, the BOCC imposed a 20-foot height limitation to any building within the activity envelope as they were aware, even back in 1995, uh, Resolution 95-179, that a building height over 20 feet might break the ridge line. This height restriction carried forward to subsequent decisions, and although the standard story pole height was recently changed to 28 feet, that doesn't imply, as Tom indicated, that the county can impose restrictions to building height and mass to residential building to a residential building which would break the ridge line to me and to Molly and <clears throat> our side staff the staff completely ignored the history of the 20 foot height restrictions and should have placed story poles of less than 20 feet on the activity envelope on lot 3 to verify if Patel's claim that he couldn't build on the lot was valid or not. In fact, Administrative Decision 29-2015, just two years ago, Cindy Hooban, Community Development Director, did precisely that to a neighbor in my very subdivision, Charles Schwester, who, relies on, who resides on lot 14. And Cindy based her decision on the 1995 resolution I mentioned above, and that's lot three. Charles Schwester was obligated to reduce the height of his CDU from 25 to 20 feet by this very same land planner, Lanny Co Lammy Coach, Tammy Cochin, who is the lead planner for this application before you. So my simple question to the commissioners would be if the staff imposed a 20-foot limit to Charles Schwester in my subdivision, why would they also not impose the same limit to Mr. Patel or at a minimum at least attempt to find out if the 20-foot poles or less would break the ridge line? This is of critical importance to Molly and me because we had always thought after reviewing all these decisions that a residential building on lot three to a height of 20 feet would never infringe on our privacy because we would never see the house due to the natural ridge that we have discussed separating us. The applicant was well aware of these restrictions when he purchased lot three in July of last year. 
Furthermore, and Tom just mentioned this as well, but I'd like to reiterate it. The planning staff and applicants state that one of the primary reasons for approving the amended Patel envelope is based on the fact that the new envelope is less constrained on flatter land than the original envelope and that there are multiple residential sites. This false conclusion was passed to the hearing officer for her determination approval of April 18, 2007 in the staff memo and she agreed with those findings. However, we feel confident that we can prove conclusively in three minutes with the visual aid of SOPRIS engineering slope analysis survey and the recent reconfigured proposed activity envelope plus a very deceptive photo on page 10 of the Patel application that the staff recommendation to the hearing officer stating that the new envelope is less constrained is false. Additionally, the, approval, the approved amended Patel envelope requires an extended driveway, as Tom mentioned, through this 30 to 40 foot high ridge separating the two sections of the approved envelope. And it is clear that the applicant must cut through this ridge to reach the south side, our side, so he can get his view of Mount Sobers. The driveway extension is unnecessary as the applicant already has an approved envelope and an approved access. Which would require no cut through the ridge whatsoever. The hearing officer correctly denied the upper portion of the proposed new drive alignment based on her conclusion that it will result in more vegetation disturbance and create additional impacts on wildlife. Tom has gone over this, but I'd like to add a little bit more. Um, therefore, it is appropriate to maintain the existing ac access activity envelope. That was the hearing officer disallowing the upper portion of the new uh, proposed access. For the very same reason, as Tom said, the hearing officer erred in not applying the exact same reasoning to the extended section of the new drive alignment through and over the ridge. For this section of the ridge is far larger and steeper and will result in even more disturbance and impact on wildlife. My only conclusion, oh, I'd like to introduce a letter. In fact, I want to this is on the record already. This was written by Lily Harriman, who is the current board member of the Emma Caucus. And after our uh, January 18th Emma Caucus meeting, she volunteered to go up and look at the property. And her conclusion is this. And she wrote this to the Emma Caucus, to Liz and Margaret. And uh, that was forwarded by them to staff here. However, quote, however, I believe that his, his Patel driveway would have even more of an unnecessary negative impact. The faded topo map that Dr. Patel's team introduced is deceptive and doesn't show the continuation of the ridge that would have to be crossed and cut through. The new proposed driveway would destroy more than twice as much of the natural landscape than the original approved access with big swaths of 100, 100 feet wide, winding down the ridge, down a ravine, and apparently with a cut through the larger ridge that continues down the hillside. This has more terrain, would permanently scar the land, and ne negatively affect wildlife and be more visible than the approved access, which descends gently down an existing path.
Okay. Um, during. I'm basically still on the extended driveway. My only conclusion as to why the hearing officer did not apply the same reasoning to the larger ridge, which is actually lower because the land slopes down towards West Sopers Creek, is that she could not identify where the road cut through the ridge was. This in part was due to the fact that the applicant and his architect also claimed to Tom Smith that day that they didn't know where the road cut was. To Molly and me, this is sort of extraordinary. We thought this was an application for an activity envelope with a new proposed driveway, and we're, we're, we're shocked that they couldn't identify where the road was going to be. That's what we thought the application was about. But more importantly, <coughs> both land planners during the site walk walked completely off the proposed activity envelope, missing the beginning of the driveway cut by over 100 feet and around to the south through a clump of trees, all of which were also off the activity envelope. And, and I'm just as perhaps assuming this, but the hearing officer could easily have concluded that this was, in fact, the new drive corridor, which it isn't, and it wasn't. And if you wish, I can show you on a topographical map where the planners walked off the, the uh, uh, lot three and off the activity envelope. And I know you asked me before, um, about Molly taking the photos there. At one point, Molly and I were very interested in buying Lot 3. We spent a lot of time on Lot 3. We bought David Bork's prop, uh, Lot 4, and he wanted to sell us Lot 3. So we went to Lot 3 often to look at it very carefully. And that's one of the reasons we were there. Um, so, in conclusion, it is very clear to us that our privacy, our privacy on Lot 4 is going to be greatly infringed on. The uh, applicant makes the argument that, well, he'll be, he hasn't identified how far he will be, but if he comes over the ridge, as you can see from those photographs, from our hot tub, our master bedroom, our master bath, the guest room, the decks, we will look towards the northeast and we will clearly see that house. And if that's the case, if that does happen, in this subdivision where currently there are only eight, permit, eight homes, we will be the first one with the direct, in the direct view plane of another house. And I don't think that was the intention of the BOCC when they approved all these previous uh, decisions. Eighty-three percent of the permanent residents in West Sopers Ranch oppose this application and have signed letters from, uh, and they are recorded, they are on record. They're concerned that the two additional vacant lots with our subdivision could also be amended if this determination is not reversed. We have a petition of an additional 30 residents in Basal, Emma, and Aspen who have signed uh, a petition I drew up called Stop Ridge Cuts in the West Sopers Creek Scenic View Corridor, and I'd be happy to hand those over to you. And we have, as I mentioned, a very uh, strong letter from Lily Harriman from the Emma Caucus. So in conclusion, we feel that the previous BOCC decisions should be honored and enforced. Residents in the county rely heavily on these decisions to make important real estate purchases and to protect what they have bought. It is inappropriate to rescind these decisions 
just because the applicant feels that his building lot is substantially challenged. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, Tom, you're all done for right now? Yeah. Okay, um, are there any questions, at least for, uh, wait a second. No, no, wait. Are there any questions for staff? Uh, because. I want to see if Molly wanted to have something to say. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, and I, I would have a question for the Mortons also. Okay, and again, the question would be uh, in terms of our, the appeal, in terms of what we're looking at, right? But Molly, yeah. did you want to say something? That's an idea, Molly. Don. Make it short. And Go ahead. Sorry, Just make sure our you. microphone is close enough so it can be recorded. Okay. Or bring it closer, yeah. Okay. Can you hear? Okay. Um, John kind of already covered what I was just briefly going to talk about, which is uh, the privacy of our home that we are going to lose, um, have a house built right behind our home, and the loss of possible property value in our home. So John and I feel what is right for the land, the environment, and our privacy rights as homeowners is that Patel builds his home on the original envelope. There is a large bench of land to build a gracious home with gorgeous views of Independence Pass, the cirque and the snow mass, the red cliffs of, of Basalt Mountain, the sun and moon rising in the east, even incorporating um, views of Mount Sopris. His drive corridor is a beautiful approach winding down through a pristine draw that John and I have kept totally natural. Um, he could do all of this with a one-story, possibly 20-foot high ceilings, and a wonderful home. Just good architectural design, and the home can snug into the hillside with varying roof lines, and it would hardly be seen from the scenic byway if done correctly and not break ridge lines. But um, Matt Patel wants to cut through an ancient ridge line, making his drive twice as long and build a home on the other side of the ridge line. This new site is a short distance directly northeast of our home and totally visible from our master bedroom, master bath, and both guest rooms. Our privacy is lost and so is his. He could be very private on the original site using the ridge line as a natural barrier. He's never lived on our hillside, so he doesn't understand how sound travels alarmingly well up in the mountains. There is no natural topographical barriers as other homes have separating views of both home sites. We stand to lose a precious amount of privacy, which doesn't need to happen if he moves back over the ridge, which has, has that natural topical barrier. And John and I knew lot two was always there and with a house already built down on West Sobers Creek Road, so we never imagined someone would do this. I'll keep it short and sweet. So we ask you BOCC members to take into account the moral and ethical issues of privacy presented here. We're trying so hard to be good stewards of this land. Um, here's your chance for all of you to make a difference and um, deny this application, setting a precedent for future homeowners in the valley to feel comfortable that the rights set forth in land planning use codes are upheld. So I wanna thank you very much for your time and your thoughtful analysis. Thank you, Molly. So uh, the reason I asked whether there's gonna be any questions for staff to, uh, to address any of the comments that Tom said was, again, we're here just to determine whether the hearing officer has abused her discretion and or made clear and demonstrable errors in approving the application. So I just want to remind you, Steve, in terms of, mm -hmm. we don't want to wander off in terms of. Uh, no, I think this is directly that's fine. Great. related to that. You, uh, John, you described a site visit. Now, were you on the site visit when Sarah Oates came and walked around the property? I was. And that's what you were describing when you were saying they were wandering around and couldn't show where the road was. So they were I found the site walk. You might want to get closer to the microphone. I'm okay. sorry, it's the record. Yeah, no, I'm sorry. I find I found the site walk um, 
very discouraging. It was very unorganized. There were about 12 of us. We were scattered all over. You, you were there. Little clumps, two uh, people here, three people there, two people. Wandering around, the first part was sort of okay as we walked down through the draw. But once we approached the ridge, the groups broke off. Um, Suzanne Wolf and Sarah Oates went alone ahead of Tammy Koken. Tammy Koken, my wife, and a neighbor were together. And Molly told Tammy, Tammy, do you realize you're off the building, the activity envelope? And Tammy said, am I really? And she didn't understand that she was. So the map came out. She attempted to locate her position on the map. And according to Molly, Molly could tell the story, she couldn't. And so what happened was she followed Suzanne. And they were well off the activity envelope and well past where we estimate the road cut was going to start to go through the ridge. You can see that little sharp hook. Well, it's got to go. We don't know because anyway, you can only look at the map. But it has to start angling into the ridge in order to make that turn, which is right on the border of the activity envelope. And it gets very steep there. And I surmise it's steeper than 30 degrees, but we'll find that out eventually. So I hope that answers. So thank you. I just wanted to see if, if, if that was what Sarah Oates was seeing and then basing her determination on that site visit. I, I wanted. Well, I think you'll have to descriptions. ask. Well, think, thank you for giving that to us. I think you'll have to ask Suzanne Wolf because the two of them went off alone. What they discussed, I don't know. But why Suzanne didn't stop and ask all of us, you know, uh, they should have gathered again. Well, where is this road cut going to go through the ridge? And the, uh, it broke up. And. Uh, even on top of the ridge, where we finally got, there were little groups scattered around the top of the ridge, too. So I found that discouraging in the sense that we've put a lot of effort and, unfortunately, a huge amount of money in defending a piece of property that we thought we would never have to defend. And I think as a recommendation to the staff and to the commissioners who are involved with this, that it's important to, for the staff to get this get this thing more organized. It's 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 been a, it's a problem. I can tell you, it's a problem. And there, well, okay, that's it. okay. So George, could we have Suzanne Wolf um, speak about oh. when you were walking with Sarah Oates on this site visit? What what you were your recollections of what happened? Um, you're at the table. And, and, and I guess uh, as long as you're up there, Suzanne, uh, uh, to follow up with Steve's question, is um, is it usual or unusual to um, uh, to have a specific driveway alignment right at that point during a scenic review, or does that come more in terms of the actual uh, site application? Well, there really wasn't a scenic review, scenic review is, though. Right. So, a couple of things, I guess. If yeah. we're just if you just want me to stick to the access and the site visit, I have a number of comments and I don't know if you want me to respond at this point or wait till after the, the applicant has responded. But mm -hmm. I guess to start with Steve's question about the site visit, um, we've all been on site visits together and I think everyone understands the difficulty of working together, walking together as a group and not having everybody split up. My primary concern on the site visit is making sure that we're trying to talk facts, we're looking at features, we're you know walking the property um, and not debating the merits of the application because we're not on the record. Um, Rye was also on the site visit, and I think that we were very conscious of making sure that that was not going on. So I don't think I was having any conversation with Sarah specific at that point other than we were all walking around, yes, that was not staked necessarily in terms of where the envelope was. Um, when Tammy and I did our original site visit before the hearing officer before the hearing officer site visit, so this first staff site visit, it was under snow. Um, so again, there were features that we were trying to all understand and, and figure out where we were on the property. 
um, that did appear disorganized at points, and sometimes that is how these site visits work. Again, we you know we were trying to establish where we were on the property, and and I think. You know, in the end, I feel like we, we walked the entire area. We walked the previously approved envelope, the area where they want to extend the envelope, the proposed access, the original, the previously established or approved corridor, basically, for the, for the access. Um, so I feel like we, we accomplished on the site visit what the intent of, of the site visit is, which is to get a comprehensive view of the property um, and, and you know, wh where those areas are. Um, George, to your question about the extension of the driveway, um, from my perspective, what the, the hearing officer was approving, or and what Sarah approved, is an activity envelope. Once you get onto the property, what's shown here, and kind of with the should it be this better for yeah. right? I guess maybe that does help if I show yeah um, over here. So this basically access envelope that was approved by Sarah is on the Morton's property within the blanket easement that is granted across parcel four to get to parcel three. That's essentially the access envelope that in the determination when she refers to access envelope, that's what this is. It's the access to get to the property. Once you're here, this is being the, the property line, we're on the property. This whole area is the activity envelope that has been approved by the hearing officer. Yes, the proposed, um, the application showed that prior map which had the, you know, this area shown on there, but that may not necessarily be what is the final alignment for the driveway once they come in at site plan review. So to that point, I mean, again, we are working within the confines of an envelope and, and reviewing the constraints on the property um, and not necessarily sp looking at the specific exactly how is the driveway aligned you know, that would have to be demonstrated at site plan and we would, you know, apply those scenic view criteria at that point to the actual structure that's proposed as well as the infrastructure to get there, which would be the driveway. So, um, one second, Patty. So on the scenic review then, um, you, you really can't tell at, th at this point uh, whether that's going to uh, not comply with our scenic review code, or how scarred that the scarring may uh, impact that from the driveway specifically. Yes. No, we we you know we have not done that analysis right because we're not looking at you know once basically beyond the the, the corridor to get there in terms of exactly how that driveway might work within the activity envelope that has been approved. So that was what we would look at in detail at site plan review. Right. So that's pretty much my question. Um, at this point, we don't exactly know where the structure will be. Therefore, we don't know exactly where the driveway will be to get to the structure. And we don't know where to put story poles because we don't know where the house is going to be or how the house is going to be designed. And it's my understanding from past history, both in planning and zoning and being on this board, we need that information to show if it's going to break the ridge line, what the seating impacts are going to be, what the constraints will be, uh, if there's any need for variances, which is a whole nother process as we know. But it also provides the neighbors, the caucus, anybody and everybody to actually comment and be part of that next review phase. Is that correct? It's an, another opportunity to um, either support or oppose the actual structure and location of the actual physical structure and the, the necessary, you know, um, infrastructures, where the septic will be, where the driveway will be, where all those things will be. And that's in the next step in site plan review and scenic. Correct. Scenic okay. is a component of, of that. Plan. Rachel? Thank you. Uh, there are times when we're confronted with uh, land use decisions where at least it feels a little like you have a, a cart in front of the horse. And uh, what I would like to ask is, after an activity envelope is approved, um, can there be an outright denial of access to it? Or would it be more of a process of mitigation and variance? I mean, when, when, once that activity envelope is established, it, it sounds like that driveway is going to go through that ridge 
one way or the other, whether it's a matter of variances or mitigation. We, I mean, we, we would have to review that. I mean, again, at this point, you know, the envelope has been revised to avoid what's shown, you know, to date based on the survey work, you know, that it avoids 30% slopes. Um, you know, if they come back in, we'd need, you know, we would need to look at that. I guess I, I wouldn't say it, it, we, we've approved an envelope um, at this point. So they do have to demonstrate once they lay in the house in a driveway and that all of those things comply, you know, is there anything, any more survey information that shows that, you know, are there slopes that weren't shown at activity envelope that are now, you know, more, better defined? Um, can they meet the driveway standards, you know, truly fully designed for width and grade and, you know, that kind of detailed driveway plan and profile that we see at site plan review and not with an activity envelope <laughs> review? So that's part of what we'd be looking at. Um, and, and in this case, right, I mean, everything up here, I mean, it's been acknowledged since the first time this got approved in 1990-something, um, that there were clearly, you know, going to be scenic impacts from anything, you know, up here. Um, so, so I, you know, I think that obviously would yeah. be part of... I, I mean, I guess I'm just kind of asking, and I realize it's difficult to answer, but if an activity envelope is approved, isn't there a going to be a de facto approval of the driveway w with mitigation or variances as opposed to saying you can't have an access that doesn't uh, violate these standards so therefore uh, you have an activity envelope you can't build or you can't you can't access I mean it just seems that one will lead to the other C can I just tag on uh, it's, it's, okay. it's direct the variance, though, is not a given. You have to show hardship, and you'd have to show that there was no other place on the property to build. So it would be my understanding, my feeling, that if that driveway was deemed to be not, a, a, you know, approvable, then then maybe they would have to revert back to the other building site, the other activity envelope that may have had a driveway that could have been built without variances. You have to pretty much, I think, determine on the property that there's no other place to build. That's your hardship for being granted a variance. Because I've always been concerned like you, the cart's before the horse, so does that just guarantee you you're gonna get your variance? And having been involved in that, to me it doesn't. You have to show me hardship and that there's no other place on the property that you could actually build a structure. And, the, and, the, and, and again, if we're speaking in the language of variance, you know, under the code, that's specific to what the Board of Adjustment can grant, and that's specific to a setback variance. And so again, here that, I think this, blue hatched area, you know, shows the, the setback, which is the front yard setback of 100 feet into the property. Um, so again, a variance, you know, our language about variance is specific to, is it a hardship, you know, that forces your need to be in, the, in a setback, um, as opposed to a variance of a slope, you know, or a constraint standard or something like that, um, I think. And maybe that's not what your intent was to, you know, Again, under code, I'm kind of speaking. Yeah. Is that what you're? Yeah, no, I just, uh, I, again, sometimes, as I said, it seems that uh, uh, folks, it's a little bit of log rolling that, well, we've already been approved for this, so go ahead and give us that and, and let us uh, try to mitigate. And uh, I, I just have concerns that uh, it seems to be moving forward without understanding what those future impacts may be and then um, having to live with them. I mean, I do have uh, any examples where ComDev has, has forced someone to move their activity envelope because the driveway could not comply or uh, that it's been denied and not just mitigated so that uh, there had to be a change in the building activity envelope. I, I can remember one where they actually had to go to another area on the property that was more appropriate, which could be, de, you know, de facto to the already approved, the previous I, building. I envelope. appreciate that, Patty. In recent history that you can recall? Yeah, I, I can recall one, too, recent history. Up Woody. That's good, because I'm, I'm drawing a blank. Yeah. I'm, thinking I'm, you guys are I'm, thinking Woody, I'm thinking up Woody Creek. I was thinking about that one, a slightly different scenario, um, in which case, I mean, in that case, the envelope had, the, the building envelope or activity envelope had no issues. It was the access yeah. all I along that, that yeah. had issues at activity envelope and at site plan. But I think our point to 
you know, the staff recommendation as well as the approval by the hearing officer is that this envelope, if you take away the access and say basically this envelope as it's been shown complies with code in terms of avoiding slopes of greater than 30%, um, you know, whatever the other things, wildlife, wildfire, same as the previously approved envelope complied with code. We didn't make any find, you know, there wasn't a finding that this was more constrained or less constrained than the original one. The, the question is with an application is, does this application, does this envelope comply with code? The answer to that from the determination was yes, this complies with the code. When they come back at site plan, they're gonna show how they're gonna use this envelope that avoids constraints to the extent required under the code. Okay. Um, so that's, so the, the discussion about, you know, kind of how is that driveway gonna work and how is it gonna, you know, fit and is it gonna accomplish what it needs to and can they really put a house outside of the setback in this, you know, all of that is, is left open at this point because we don't know the answer to any of those things. We don't have that information in front of us and we don't expect to have that information when we're reviewing an activity envelope. Can I ask one further question? Uh, I, I think it might be for you, but it might be for Tammy as well, I don't know. Um, what happened to the 20 foot height restriction on this site uh, as opposed to, I, I really don't see it referenced in the hearing officer's uh, decision. Right, so when this was first approved back in the 90s, um, 1041 review, we had no site plan review, we just had established an envelope. At that time, it was recognized this, you know, this lot is gonna have scenic issues. So at the time, the best we could do was say, let's throw a height limit on it, 20 feet. I don't, you know, I can't say how that was, you know, agreed to. Measured and but once they came back to reestablish the activity envelope and I think 2011 was the first time, at that point, we we're under the 2006 code where we have this separate step now where we have site plan review and we knew at that point we'll review the scenic impacts, the ridgeline impacts, and we agree. They said, can we take this condition off because we know we're gonna have to make all these demonstrations through site plan and we said, yes, that makes sense. We don't need that in there. That's not to say that through the scenic view protection review, it you know might not result in a reduction in height in order to comply, but we left it more open for somebody to determine based on the specifics on the site, how can I design to meet the code and whether that be a 20 foot height limit or not, or 20, you know, can it go to 20, you know, they have the flexibility to determine that and demonstrate that to us through the process. And so if they weren't able to demonstrate it through their architectural designs, once you get to site specific design, um, the uh, ComDev department could make a determination that you can't build higher than 18 feet. Right, right. Uh, the, just whatever's the required to, whatever to meet the code. Whatever it takes to, to demonstrate that, say, it won't break the ridge line. Um, and, you know, really there, then it says, you know, the only option of, is if you have no alternative, you know, is the only way that something could approve something that projects above a ridge line. But that would only be in the circumstance where you'd gone to every, you know, other des every design parts option of the parcel you have, as right, well to try and, and, and other, uh, other activity envelope potentials. Okay, thank you. So I just want to follow up that really quick, Steve, and I'll get to you. Uh, so when I look at at least one of the findings from the hearing officer determination, based on this conversation, uh, it, it, it includes the proposed development will be reviewed pursuant to the scenic view protection area standards at site plan review, pretty much what you've just been discussing, right? So it sounds like the hearing officer uh, acknowledges that, uh, that that's, that's a process that needs to happen. Right. Correct, and it's okay. basically the same condition that was on the prior activity envelope approvals as well. All right, thank you, Steve. Um, I have a question about the 100-foot setback from the property line. Um, that it seems unusual to me that the building envelope goes right up to the property line, and what are they actually allowed to do within that 100-foot setback the activity line? Activity envelope. Uh, yeah, we often approve an activity envelope that extends to the property line because um, there can be certain development that, that can occur within the setback. Not a structure, but a septic system, obviously extension of your driveway coming through there, potentially landscaping, 
a well, possibly, you know, different, you know, different elements are allowed within that setback. Okay, so it wouldn't be structure the structure, but has to comply. Other, other stuff. Yeah, right. So it would be they would have to obtain a variance from the Board of Adjustment to put a structure within that 100-foot setback. Okay. And that is a condition, Steve, in the hearing officer determination number 14 that talks about what is allowed in those setbacks and, and the grade change that can occur. Okay. Thank Any, you. Anything else at this point for staff? So the uh, representatives for Patel. Good afternoon. My name is Chris Bryan. I'm an attorney here in town. I represent the applicant. Uh, joining me at the table um, is the architect for um, this project, and he was actually at the site visit, so I'm gonna let him respond to some of the issues that were immediately mentioned by the Mortons to start with, and then I'll, um, I'll discuss some of the legal issues. Sure, hi, uh, my name is Luke Bamberger. I'm an architect out of Denver, Colorado, and I've been working with Matt on this project since uh, last fall. Um, yeah, just to uh, clarify a couple things on the site walk, um, we would have gladly staked the activity envelope, if, uh, if, if that was something that would have been asked of us. If it wasn't, we, we assumed the uh, purpose of the site walk, like Suzanne Wolf mentioned, was to, uh, to walk around the site, to get the lay of the land. Um, and in our minds, uh, the driveway that was shown on our drawings looping around the ridge was by no means the final driveway that was going to be uh, put into place. Um, so we didn't see any reason that we should have staked that. Um, we maybe in hindsight should have left that off the uh, application. That maybe if, maybe has caused more of a headache than it, it has, has helped in the matter. But um, yeah, so we, we in our minds, uh, all of this was going to be decided in the site plan stage of this project. So we, um, we didn't feel it was necessary to, to stake it uh, just to be be clear about that. Um, the other matter that was brought up by Tom was the exercise with the story poles, which was uh, uh, an early request by uh, the county. Uh, they felt it was important just to at least test some of the buildable sites on the activity envelope to see if there was a potential for a 20 foot, 28 foot structure to break the plane. And so our direction uh, to our contractor, Ryan Ivey, <coughs> uh, we, we gave him a drawing with some of these flat uh, buildable areas, areas with less than 15% slope, and we had him go out with poles that were 28 feet tall, so they had a flag at the top, and they had an intermediary, an intermediate flag as well. And I have to go back and look at my email, but I think they were at either 16 or 20 feet. Basically, it was a way so we could determine from, from below when we were taking pictures, uh, you know, could you see that intermediate uh, flag breaking the plane? And that would give us an additional level of information. So I just want to make that clear. And I think Tom mentioned that we put a couple of poles out. I think we put at least six poles out on the site. We tested uh, on the north side in the existing activity envelope, and then we put a pole uh, on the south side of the ridge in the kind of flatter area uh, outside of that 100 foot setback as well. Um, I feel like the site walk was, was very productive. I brought a large uh, drawing, the, the survey that SGM provided for us with the overlay of our proposed activity envelope. And I was uh, pretty good about, you know, as we were walking through the site trying to identify where we were uh, as we were going. Let me address uh, briefly, because I know that we're approaching the, the third hour of this part of your meeting. Um, I, I want to just briefly remind this board how it sits. I know that um, Mr. Smith, at the beginning of his presentation, discussed the standard of review, and I know that the chair has uh, acknowledged that at the beginning of these proceedings, and I know that um, your legal counsel has, has advised you of that as well. But um, we want to be sure that, that 
the consideration here doesn't wander beyond your jurisdiction. We wouldn't want to commit error here. Um, and so you're really just reviewing for whether the hearing officer abused her discretion or made a clear and demonstrable error. Um, there has been no allegation. There's a third prong, which is denial of procedural due process, but that hasn't been alleged and that's not uh, implicated here. In, in, in Mr. Smith's um, and, and the Morton's 50-minute presentation, I didn't hear any uh, code provisions that they believe uh, were violated, and I didn't hear any code provisions that they say warrants um, a finding of an abuse of discretion. As you know, that's a highly deferential standard under Colorado law and under your own, own code. I think in this case, um, your staff has done an exemplary job of working with the applicant and taking on input from a, a wide variety of people. This has been a deliberative process that I think um, shows really the best parts of land planning in this county because so much circumspection has occurred. Um, the hearing officer, and, and I'll just refer you to her determination, makes very specific findings and imposes very onerous requirements on my client um, that is going to have to be done at the um, site plan review stage. And that's something to remember. I, I know Commissioner Richards used the term cart before the horse in a slightly different context, but it seems to me, sitting here today and after hearing the Mortons and Mr. Smith's presentation, that they might be putting the cart before the horse. A lot of the objections or issues that they would like to raise here, I think, are properly um, postured in the site review, the site plan review stage, not this initial or preliminary um, phase. You know, it's, it's almost ironic because uh, Mr. Smith's, uh, in his appeal letter, his, his first um, complaint, so to speak, is that the uh, applicant and the hearing officer discussed and uh, addressed uh, scenic view protection area issues that aren't required usually to be addressed until the, the site plan review phase. So they're almost critiquing us for being proactive and, and looking at those issues uh, um, prospectively. Um, and as is stated in the staff memo that you have, staff asked for that. They wanted a preliminary um, acknowledgement or uh, discussion of, of those issues as might pertain to uh, the activity envelope approval phase. So I think the applicant is to be credited for that, for trying to work in issues that we know are going to be germane as early into the process as possible. But even if you feel for some reason, and there's no basis in your code to do this, but even if you did decide that the hearing officer should not have listened or considered those issues, that's still not an abuse of discretion. That's not a clear and demonstrable error. If anything, staff, applicant, and the hearing officer widened their gaze instead of narrowing the gaze at this early preliminary phase. And that's, and that's an important consideration from the legal review that, you, that you're tasked with today. Um, Mr. Smith also says that um, the hearing officer exceeded her jurisdiction by not following the rules, although I didn't hear any uh, mention of rules that were not followed. And I think if you walk through, and I know you've done this already, so I'm not going to uh, go through the tedium of it, but both the recitals of the uh, determination number 2-2017 uh, that's in your packet and uh, the requirements that follow are incredibly detailed. And I, I can tell you, as you could have probably already gathered, both from this process and from the hearing today, this is going to be a very difficult process uh, that the applicant is, is willing and able to go through uh, with uh, the consultation and guidance of land use professionals, architects, engineers. This is not being taken on lightly. This is not an arbitrary and capricious process. And I mention that term because, as you know, that is, um, under Colorado law, what informs an abuse of discretion finding. Here, the hearing officer was very careful not to be arbitrary and capricious. In fact, she had sub-sub points to some of the things that she says is going to have to be done at the site plan review stage. And that's where I think some of the Morton's um, uh, critiques or complaints will be better lodged and will be, have to be addressed by the applicant. And we're prepared to do that. But we need to get to that phase so that we're not putting the cart before the horse, so to speak. Um, with respect to so, some of the specific issues that Mr. Smith touched on, Again, I, I, don't, I, I believe that he's asking 
this board to conduct a de novo review, which means from scratch or anew, which is not what you're allowed to do under your code. You're only allowed to review for abuse of discretion. Um, but what Mr. Smith seems to be asking you to do is to go through some of these issues like privacy or the driveway or the height or the ridge line, and all those scenic view issues are going to be addressed um, at site plan review. And so let's get to that point and, and, and deal with them when, they're, when we're supposed to. I think the staff memo does a very good job of explaining how the variance process works. Um, I think most of you are familiar with that, uh, but it, it, it does show, and even the hearing officer, I think in, um, I wanna say it was in uh, section 14, talks about the variance that, um, the variance process, and that granting this activity envelope review it is, is not akin or is not a de facto grant of a variance. That's a different process, a different standard. Your code is very good at being regimented and detailed, separating those two standards, and we shouldn't ignore the distinctions that your code already makes, because your code does a good job of that. We should follow the code. I think the um, hearing officer's determination, uh, I can't find one instance of where it, to use Mr. Smith's words, didn't follow the rules or exceeded jurisdiction. If, if anything, she was um, considering more than she had to and was um, adamant in, in her detailed determination of what things the applicant still had left to do through phase two and beyond of this process. Um, with respect to the uh, appellant's concern that, um, and this is number five in your staff memo, uh, that the appellant states that the approval is inconsistent with prior approvals granted by the county for development of the subject parcel. The staff response is, is spot on. Um, it, it says that while this activity envelope does differ from the previously approved activity envelope, approvals and permits can and often are, as you know, amended so long as they comply with the land use code. This activity envelope complies with your land use code. That's the end of the discussion. The hearing officer did the right thing. She did not abuse her discretion. She was not arbitrary and capricious. I understand the Mortons feel passionate about this issue. I understand Mr. Smith has a lot to say about this. I've been in his position before, as you know. I am sympathetic to his position. I just wanna make sure that procedurally, we address those issues at the proper time um, and, and, and don't create um, a, a legal problem where there isn't one right now. Um, to the extent that the Morton's primary focus of challenging this land use application is uh, driven by privacy concerns of not having any homes within three miles or, or, or whatever the distance was. I will note that they did have an opportunity like two other parcels on this property to obtain either scenic view easements or to have design review controls and, and they didn't exercise those rights. They said that they had the the potential and maybe the uh, opportunity to purchase uh, this parcel and, and they chose not to. The point being that the privacy concerns that I think are driving this are not an absolute legal right, that they have a, a right under your land use code to not have any other houses within a 360 degree view of them. There are certain legal mechanisms that they could uh, conceivably have undertaken to achieve that if that was their goal, but that's not what's at issue here. So um, unless there are any questions from the board, I, I would just conclude by saying that under the pr pretty narrow straitjacket that you've got to wear here, um, sitting here on review for abuse of discretion or clear and demonstrable error, there's been none. Your hearing officer did a very good job. Your staff has done a remarkably good job of um, working with everyone in a professional manner and applying your very complex land use code in a proper way at this early phase of this process. Patty, and then yeah, Rachel. Um, you know, I, I agree with you on a lot of points, but I also agree that with the Mortons that, you know, they had an expectation when they purchased their, their property, you know, what, what could be and where it could be built on the neighboring property. But that being said, I don't think there was anything in that prior activity envelope approval that said this envelope has to be where it is, it has to stay here, that it can't be altered or changed or moved around the property. That would have been the smart thing to have been added to that or put into the text of that previous approval, that this is where it's gonna be so that the neighbors in the neighborhood 
know what to expect in the future. And I'm sorry that wasn't done, but it's, I don't think that I'm not familiar with us ever really doing that, but it could have been done at the time. They could have written that in there. And so I think it's difficult because, you know, I can understand your passion for your property and your privacy and you live there and you love the land. And I think it would be hard for me too to be a neighbor that had something that was being moved around on the neighboring property. But, you know, that, that is what it is. And that's what is happening. And it doesn't mean that this activity envelope that was approved by, you know, the hearing officer recently may be the, where it ends up. I mean, it could come up with a lot of issues that render that not where the house needs to go. That's still the next phase, phase one, phase two, of where that property, where that structure could actually go in the future. So again, I think that's gonna be the opportune time for the neighbors, especially the Mortons, to actually come in and say, we want an 18 foot height limit. We know the driveway is gonna be impacted. You know, we want this looked at, we want that looked at, because that's where you can really voice those concerns about the scenic overlay, the scenic overview, the, the, the actual site specifics of the height of the house and where the house is gonna be and the access to the house. So, and, that, and I wish that language had been written into that previous activity envelope, but it's my understanding that it's not there. And, and in, in brief response to that, Commissioner Popper, I, I do think that because that wasn't set in stone or um, known to all, my client relied when they purchased the property that under the land use code there might be some opportunity. variation to that. Um, and so there's reliance on, on that end too. I, I think my client might have bought another parcel of land if that had been as you hypothesized it could have been. Yeah. Rachel? Yeah, thank you. Um, and thank you for your presentation. Uh, the one question I have, um, Mr. Smith referred to um, a violation of code uh, of Picking County Land Use Code 2.1.1 that all land use applications, you know, through the all land use application manual uh, must include grading and uh, road alignment information. Is that your understanding as well, or what is your impression there? Th that is not my understanding. That's a provision from the manual, not the land use code itself. I think staff might be better equipped um, to address that issue, but based on my review, that doesn't constitute a violation that would warrant an abuse of discretion or a finding of clear and demonstrable error by this panel. Okay. Um, is it okay to pursue that question with Suzanne then, or? Yeah, well, I, it's a good question. What's the difference between the code and the manual? Yeah, and please come to a microphone. <laughs> um, the manual is was adopted in 2006 when we did the new code in order to basically take some of the uh, submission requirements out of the code and put them in a separate document that you know we could we could revise as needed and um, work with. So the application manual itself is separate from the code. It is referenced you know from the code that that's where the submission requirements live. Um, the specific one that Tom cites, um, I don't have the exact language in, with, from me, I just have his, his version about the preliminary grading for access alignment. Again, I think we, we looked at you know the slope impacts, obviously, from the two, yeah, again, more of this access envelope in terms of getting there. Again, we were not looking at the specifics of the driveway once it got into the activity envelope. Um, we were looking at, is this a corridor that's adequate to accommodate the width for a driveway? Um, does it impact slopes of over 30%? We looked at that, you know, the concerns about disturbance from wildlife perspective. Those were the kinds of things that we would no we are normally looking at here. Um, I think within the manual, again, I don't, I don't have the language in front of me. You know, I think we have some discretion to make that determination about to what level, you know, of detail we might need. Um, you know, again, and, and usually we're seeing that kind of detail on a specific design, you know, the grading necessary to accommodate that, the width, you know, those kinds of things at site plan. So you're um, saying essentially that those specific items in that level of specificity will be part of the site plan review and uh, scenic review at that time? Definitely. Thank you. I, I see you, Tom. Hold on. Uh, any other questions for uh, Chris? No, not, not at this time. I don't. All right. I, 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 we're going to give George. Tom a chance to re do a rebuttal, but we've been going a couple hours. I'd like to take a short five-minute break. No. Well, I'm only going to take a couple of minutes if that helps. 
couple minutes. Okay. Yeah. I'm, I'm not going to belabor this, but um, <laughs> to get next to a mic here. Um, <laughs> So that it's clear, Chris uh, said that I didn't refer to any code provisions that are violated, and that's absolutely incorrect. Rachel has referred to one, and that is Section 2.1.1 of the uh, Land Use Application Manual. And as Suzanne said, the manual is referenced in the code, and the adoption by reference in the code means that it's part of the code. And it says, and I'm quoting, applicants quote, must show preliminary, and this is that activity envelope, not site plan. Applic quote, must show preliminary grading. That's a line on a map that's not grading. Grading means what you do to the land. Do you cut, do you fill, that sort of thing. Preliminary grading for access drive alignment, demonstrating that the driveway can be done in conformance with driveway standards. There is nothing in here to show preliminary grading or that the driveway can be done in conformance with driveway standards. Now this circles back to what the point that Rachel raised about what's the presumption here created when you approve an activity envelope for a driveway access envelope and you don't have any of this information that's required by the code. I mean, that me, I mean, if activity envelope approval means something, it means they're entitled to, presumed to be entitled to put the driveway here, and the information required to make that determination is not in the record. It's simply not there. No preliminary grading, no demonstration of compliance with driveway standards. And Nick Day, who was the only expert engineer to address this issue, testified that that information would include, in addition to the proposed alignment, the extent of cut and fill, the need for retaining walls, preliminary drainage and erosion control, and some demonstration of what the land disturbance is going to be here, which we think is going to be dramatic. Now, on the issue of the activity envelope, Too much for sure. it's, you know, I understand the applicant's got to address what the staff tells the applicant to address and that was that included in this case some scenic view considerations my problem with that is that it's very misleading for the and and in my view against code for the hearing officer to have said this consideration of the mapped SVPA as viewed from West Sopers Creek Road by the Community Development Department as part of this application was appropriate to confirm compliance with the plan and the code. Now, all that was done here, no one has said anything different and there's nothing different in the record. All that was done here, and not six story poles, but three story poles, were put up at 28 feet. And to make a decision of that nature with respect to scenic view protection criteria is wrong because if you're going to address scenic view protection as stated clearly in the code, you have to show the building location within the activity envelope, the building size and height, elevation drawings, et cetera. Those are required if you're going to do address in any way scenic view criteria. And so it is, was wrong for the hearing officer to make any conclusions and to have made her decision based on approving this activity envelope based on a wholly incomplete consideration of scenic view protection criteria. Now, beyond that, if we assume it was correct, then why was it okay to, with respect to the driveway, not to similarly correct, uh, consider this what it says in section 7-20-120D14, that roads and driveways should avoid major road cuts, take advantage of screening and natural topography and existing vegetation. Existing roads and driveways shall be used where practical. None of that was addressed. Thank you. Before we take a break real quick, it's my understanding when we created the manual 
He did so so that we didn't have to go through code changes, through all the process of code changes. That's why we took out those specific points and put them in the manual as kind of a, a companion document of sorts. Is that true? Yeah, I think the idea was that it would be easier for us over time as we, you know, wanted to change submission requirements that we would, um, right, not have to go through a full code amendment to do that. Um, it did, as I recall, we haven't ever, ever actually fully amended it because it does require that we bring it before the board if we are making, you know, those those kinds of amendments. So, so is it deemed, um, though, technically, legally, whatever the county code, land use code? Again, I haven't pulled it up. I don't know if... Um, Right. Maybe, maybe if you're going to take a break, we, I can pull it up and let's look take at, a break. I can look let's at that reference. Otherwise, we just keep on going. Yeah. So let's take a 10 minute break. Thank you. Okay, um, where, 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 where do we leave off? <laughs> you were, you were uh, responding to a question? Uh, yeah, Tom just brought up a couple points about the grading, preliminary grading as referenced in the application manual. Um, and pre preliminary grading was submitted and was in the application. Um, this is just a plan of that preliminary grading. Now it's somewhat of a mute point because the proposed access wasn't actually the approved access that the hearing officer approved. She approved the existing access as it was previously approved in, in, in the pre-existing activity envelope. So they wouldn't have done grading for an, an access envelope that they weren't proposing. So what was approved, can I clarify? What was approved though was the easement access that was approved at the first activity envelope correct that until went, until it reaches the new property so until it reaches yes. the new property and then the driveway from there is kind of a proposed driveway not known exactly where because we don't know where the house is going to be right and just to be clear about again there's a blanket easement across the morton's right. property so that did not define a specific corridor the prior one of the prior approvals you know showed that access so the straight line access right, it, I guess, right. to, to keep it simple yeah, was it was previously shown, and that is what then Sarah ended up approving in her determination. Okay. Thank you for the clarification. All right, uh, I'm going to open this up for public comment at this time. Anybody wish to make a public comment? <laughs> Seeing nobody, I'm going to close the public comment. Rachel. Yes. Um, I would like to request an executive session to be able to have advice from council, and um, I think it's usually our, our protocol that one board member requests that we do that, and we can go into executive session from a regular meeting. For legal advice, where do for we legal go? advice? Well, uh, <laughs> make a motion and, uh, and vote on. Okay. Okay. Uh, please get on the microphone, John. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, perpetual problem. <laughs> yeah, uh, you know. Okay. Pin one on your shirt. So, so you'd have to make a motion to have it seconded and there would be a vote. Okay. Majority agrees and that would be fine. The and appropriate statutory reference for this request would be CRS 246 402 4B. 246 402B. 402B. Thank you. Um, I would uh, like to request uh, executive session for advice from our attorney. I will make that in form of a motion uh, according to revised statutes, Colorado revised statute 246-402B. I'll second. Any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 We're going to move to another room for executive we'll session. Back. And we'll, we'll be, be back. back. You guys just stay you here. You guys stay here. We leave the room. We'll leave the room.
Okay, grassroots, we're up. Uh, we'll need a motion to go out of exec. I would make a motion to go out of executive session. Second. Any further discussion? All the papers say aye. 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 Thank you. Okay, any last uh, questions for staff or for the applicant or for the other applicant, appealant? Bring it back to the board for discussion. <laughs> so what we have in front of us, again, as we've been stating all along, our role here is to determine whether the hearing officer has abused her discretion and or made clear and demonstrable errors in approving the application. George, I would make a motion for discussion. Okay, I would make a motion to approve the resolution denying the Morton appeal and affirming hearing officer's determination 002-2017. I'll second. So it seems like that the, uh, um, at least what I've heard and, and read, uh, I really can't find where the hearing officer has abused their discretion or made a clear and demonstrable error. Uh, I think that uh, there's a lot of concerns that we've heard today that are um, certainly valid, and I believe that they will, should, and will go on to the next step when, if and when this goes to site plan. Um, there's the opportunity to address a lot of these concerns and issues, um, and that seems to be the, the next appropriate place. But in terms of our role here today, uh, I'm not finding uh, any way to uh, not uphold the hearing officer's uh, decision. Patty? Yeah, I, I agree with George on those comments, but I want to make sure I'm going to ask staff, when the next process, next step for the site plan review and scenic review, what is the notification process for the neighbors? I want to make sure that the neighbors are notified well in advance. Yeah, so it's, it's exactly the same as the activity envelope. There'll be a um, mailing to all the neighbors within 300 feet of the property. Um, they'll be noticing in the paper as well as required posting at the posting property. Posting at the property. I just want to make sure that, that the Martins do not miss their opportunity to be part of that process. Well, Rachel? Yeah, thank you. Uh, these hearings are never easy, um, and uh, I appreciate the thoroughness in which these uh, bits of evidence and information have been presented by um, the Mortons as well as the representatives of our departments and the applicants. Uh, when you get down to these uh, type of hearings, it is not a new consideration of the land use application. And so I will say uh, this may or may not be a decision that I entirely agree with in terms of uh, granting uh, a new uh, activity envelope. However, I cannot find that it was arbitrary or capricious or an abuse of discretion uh, or denial of procedural due process. Um, within the county and, and probably within the entire country, it is the right of individuals to apply for a change of location of their activity envelope. Um, this is a 35 acre site. It's not um, an in-town lot where you have side yard setbacks and, and you're constrained by uh, other subdivision type of, of issues. Um, you know, and I can only think of the example of uh, vested rights which uh, we review hearings on those uh, periodically where people would like to ask for an extension of those rights because they're so significant, or they let them expire, Does and they come in with new applications for new vested rights for new activity envelopes or changed activity envelopes. Um, I have to agree with my colleagues here that um, it's very important to stay involved in the next steps. Um, there are rights of uh, neighbors to make sure that those pro are properly followed. Um, and that our staff uh, also very diligently applies those standards uh, considering impacts to wildlife court or um, other, other types of items. Um, but there really is nothing 
against someone choosing to try to change their existing zoning uh, or their existing activity envelope or existing accesses. That's, uh, that's part of the living in a free society. Uh, and it's not uh, written in stone um, that thou shall never change, um, whether it was from the original um, uh, subdivider of his ranch who went through the state 35-acre uh, subdivision uh, or otherwise. And I also believe that this board has done a very thorough job of examining the arguments that have been presented to us uh, for their uh, validity, for their um, import to the final decision. But I am going to vote in favor of the motion. Steve? Um, I concur with what you have said, Rachel. Um, it, it still baffles me why the owner of Lot 4 wants to move his building site to a point where his view of Mount Sopris is going to be framed by the neighbor's house right there. Um, I note that most of the building envelope, most of the original building envelope is still part of the proposed building envelope where, he, where the driveway would enter the property and, and I would hope that the landowner would spend a little time here and actually look at the views and realize that there is a good view of Mount Sopris <laughs> from the original building envelope and maybe would change their mind to actually want to build build their house on the, the original part of the building envelope. Um, that, that can be determined in you know, in the future process of uh, the site plan review. But I would, I would urge the architect and <laughs> the attorney for the applicant to cons at least consider that because that would be a neighborly thing to do. Any other further discussion? No. I want to thank motion. everybody for We have a second. I'll call the question. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you all for your time. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. To the members of the board and the staff. Appreciate thank it. You. Thank you. Okay. Um, you, want, you want these? Uh, they should probably. We've already got I, them I've for given the record. Jeanette a copy for the record. Yeah. I have some for the record, but. Do you want them for your file, Casey? We have them, so we don't. It's okay. okay. You want those? It's just in the letter. What do I do with them? No. 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 It's in the last <laughs> Give him to Rod. He could like plaster his bedroom with them. <laughs> All right. Put him in the office space. Put him in the office space, Rod. Right. Open discussion. Thank you. John, do we have anything for open discussion? Just a real brief, uh, brief one. We have uh, started planning the joint meeting with the city. Um, they are looking at doing a demo, actually, of e-bikes from. <laughs> downtown to our dinner location which looks like it'll be the inn at Aspen so if there are any board members interested in participating <laughs> you let us know we'll get you included on that I'll follow behind with my first aid kit and that's it how are we going to get to the inn at Aspen from town it they the city has not taken trail. action and so there is a trail within the city boundaries that you're able to to ride an e-bike on you, hmm. we're coming from town to there Okay. That's my understanding. Um, we'll get you the details if you're interested. I'll ride the bus. Uh, if possible, I would enjoy riding an e-bike perhaps around town, but no, I don't want to take it through okay. the roundabout or on 82, so I wouldn't mind trying the e-bike. But um, for dinner and then back in the dark, I'm not not as keen on that. Just uh, the, the offer, the ask was put out today. So. Okay. You have to cross the intersection at Owl Creek because there's no underpass and there's no bike trail that runs on the other side of the road. <laughs> there is a light, though. There is a light. Again, just let us know, and uh, you can say no for me. me no or, or Susan Murphy. Okay. Um, yesterday we talked about some possible dates for a site visit of Redstone, Monday or Wednesday. Since this is the last time we're going to be meeting here. Yeah, and actually, week, I think we have. Give me just a second here, because I believe that is looks like with the uh, property hours and such, it's looking like that would be the 16th at 10 in the morning. 
and in the morning on Wednesday the 16th. So those of you coming from Aspen, you're going to have to leave here by at least 8. eight. Okay, so it's on site at 10 a.m. Yeah, let me, let me just, uh, give me just a second. Or 8.30, it's be an hour and a half to Redstone. Yeah, because it, it would be uh, meeting 10 a.m. in the Redstone Inn parking lot. At Redstone Inn parking lot, okay. And, and we've set a two-hour limit on the site. Who's visit. coming up for you? Will you help me, let me know what travel well, arrangements. We will have a work session on Wednesday the day before so we can finalize. Tuesday the day before. Excuse me, Tuesday the day before. Oh, that's true. Since it's not uh, but day. let's um, Since it's not maybe day. put okay. the request in for a vehicle to come to staff. Yeah, so that we're Electric working bikes. on that. We're riding at, down there. At this point, yeah, we could do the demo there. <laughs> yeah. So this is the Wednesday the 16th? Yes. Correct. 10 o'clock at Redstone. And then we yeah. have the ambulance. Oh. And we have what? So we'll work on we'll Ambulance work on those District travel. Open House is um, that evening, correct? Ambulance that, District? That is correct. Back up here. Back up here. Okay. At 530, Perfect. I believe. <laughs> okay. Um, 530, yeah. I'm glad we could work that out. That's great. Anything else for open discussion? Reggie? Yeah, um, just, uh, I'm still getting over this cold, so I want to make sure I didn't uh, skip by this too quickly yesterday, but there are public comment period has opened for the Clean Water Act, and I wanted to make sure that we're working on um, comments on that. There, th these comment periods are coming up so fast and so frequently for so many different rules and these incredibly short windows of you know three weeks or 21 days or something that okay so I, have a, I have a question has anybody heard that senator bennett is going to be in town this weekend has anybody heard that so i let me see if i've gotten a confirmatory email i had an email that it was a possibility and I was looking for confirmation. From Sarah, is that her name? Sarah. And they said that they would have something confirmed by the end of the day tomorrow. That was yesterday. And I have not heard back, but there um, was at least discussion about a town hall happening on Friday, but we haven't gotten Could you any let me know if you hear anything? Yeah, we'll let, let all, all of you okay. know. The, the only reason we haven't put it out to you guys is we're waiting for yeah. confirmation that it is happening. I heard he was here for the weekend. Okay. okay. Great. Right. Anything else? Nope. I'm good. Thank you. I make a motion to adjourn the meeting. I will second. All in favor say aye. 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 Thank you all. Thank you, Grassroots. Thanks, guys.